You know perfectly well what I'm talking about. And if you wish to stay here under my jurisdiction, you will toe the line as I see fit, for your sake as well as mine. You have a very evil mind, Aunt Phoebe. Over the weekend of uh, February 16th through the 18th, I traveled to Concord, North Carolina to attend this year's Mad Monster Party, which was far and away the most redneck and unprofessional convention that I had ever been to in my life that was operating at this level of scale. The only thing that I could really compare it to for you is that it felt like something that was being run by that guy at your local small town comic book store that had somehow gotten out of hand. The reason for my visit was due to a large amount of negative attention that the convention had received surrounding their headlining guest of honor, the alleged rapist, Kevin Spacey. But before we get to that, I think that we should talk about the convention itself because once I arrived there, I realized very quickly how these conditions resulted in a Spacey invitation. As everything in the way that this was conducted is like the epitome of a misguided and mismanaged mess. Now, Booking Spacey is, in any sense of public optics, a very dumb idea. And you could try to write these people off as just straight up morons. But they fully understood what they were doing. As on all of their public advertisements, they just happened to forget to include Spacey along with all of the faces of the other big guests. They knew that they had to spin this. First of all, I arrived at the convention and their small main parking lot was already filled and they gave me directions to their overflow parking area that upon arrival, I realized was well over half a mile away from the event and that they had arranged no shuttle services whatsoever, meaning that I had to walk down a dirt trail that had large rocks in it in the February cold to get back to their main building, which, you know, was fine for me. I'm in relatively good health. But you can't expect all guests who want to attend your public event to be able to physically do that. At night, I then had to walk the same trail back to my car in pitch black darkness, which <laughs> is just a lawsuit waiting to happen. I'm not someone to ever actually make a complaint about something like that, but the reality of the situation is that not providing shuttle services to guests who can't walk when you make them park so far away immediately makes you seem totally unprofessional. When I finally got inside to purchase a weekend ticket at the front desk, they tried to put a paper wristband on me. I tried to clarify saying that I didn't want a day pass, I wanted the weekend pass. And they said that that was the weekend pass. I asked if they didn't have any security badges, which are the norm for essentially any con of this size, and they said no. They instead expected me to wear this paper wristband at all times for three days straight. By the second day, it was falling apart because I had taken a shower and it became very soggy and uncomfortable to wear. There were no posted schedules of the events anywhere in the building. I asked the front desk if they had any printed flyers or brochures of when the Q&A events were going to be held, and they told me no. They had nothing printed, and that the only way to find out what time things were happening was to go to the Mad Monster website and find their schedule there. At their Q&A events, the first 10 rows of the auditorium were reserved for VIP ticket holders only. The problem with that is that next to nobody purchased the VIP tickets, which resulted in the celebrities being separated from the audience by 10 mostly empty rows, really killing any kind of ability for the guests to build any kind of energy with the crowd resulting in the panels being painfully awkward at times. Also because the guests were not actually really that famous, which <laughs> we're gonna get to. The audience often just didn't have any questions for them because they didn't know who they were. So most of the Q&As only lasted for about 20 minutes or so, even though they had all been scheduled for an hour. I didn't eat before I got there the first day and expected to buy a snack at some point while I was there and was very upset to learn that there was only an alcohol stand in the convention floor and no food whatsoever. So I didn't end up eating until about 10 p.m. later that night. The next day, I did actually learn that there was a food area for the con set up in the lobby of the hotel next to the convention center, but there were no signs telling you of this, and it was very much hidden. <laughs> Luckily, the first night after having a late dinner, I could relax in the indoor pool that my hotel was advertised as having, which was just magnificent. Although, I guess I can't blame that on Mad Monster. Now, okay, first off, the argument should be made that even if the past 10 years of his life had not happened, should Kevin Spacey himself be the headlining guest at a horror convention in the first place? Most people, if you ask them what horror movie Spacey had been in, would probably space on an answer, which that answer being is that he has been in exactly one horror film. 
7, which was the primary visual theme of the convention, as they really emphasized that they had gotten Spacey as a guest by having all of the staff at the convention being marked by having these bright red shirts on them that read, What's in the Box? The photo ops with him were a staged event with a desert backdrop, where you could get on your knees in front of Kevin Spacey, with your head through a hole that they had cut in a cardboard box that he was holding. <laughs> you can't actually make that up. People were lined up for hours over the course of three days to pay Kevin Spacey, whose assets are estimated to be worth in between 16 and 20 million, $300 each to get on their knees in front of him. After the announcement in January of his inclusion at the convention, Mad Monster, as most people sadly do when they are being publicly criticized, refused to cancel Spacey's appearance, instead deciding to double down and buckle up for a rough ride. They stopped posting on their Twitter and locked all of their comments, instead deciding to focus their promotion on the more pedestrian and less socially vocal social media platforms, like Facebook and Instagram. On those platforms, they reportedly began to block anyone who said something negative about their decision or the convention, one of which was the drag queen Naomi Monroe. According to WCCB Charlotte, one fan of the convention who had been going for years named Will Kinsler, who you may know as being involved with sports video games, was blocked by the Mad Monster page for expressing his concerns, and would later tell reporters, I was dumbfounded, right? Shocked. I was disappointed immediately. It doesn't make me interested in attending this time or ever again. To invite somebody with these sorts of allegations of sexual misconduct surrounding them into what feels like our home of our community, you know, it was really concerning. It feels like a bit of a betrayal, right? I just wanted to tell them I don't think this is right and I don't like it, and now they've kind of taken my voice away from me. I'd hate for people to see this, that don't know and feel like we're a different kind of community than we are, and that we would welcome somebody in our community that's accused of doing these things that he's doing is disappointing for me, that somebody might find that that is a reflection on us, and I want people to know that that's not the case at all. They would also delete any negative comments on their posts so that it looked like everyone universally supported what they had been doing. They posted a clip from House of Cards onto their Facebook page, where Frank Underwood confronts a homeless man who has been accused by the police and is suffering from a psychotic episode where he tells him, Nobody can hear you. Nobody cares about you. Nothing will come from this. They also posted on their Instagram story an image of Spacey with the text, Nobody cares about you. One major convention manager of a different event, who will go unnamed here, criticized their decision by saying, As convention organizers, it's so important that we look at the big picture. People watch us. They watch what we're doing and who we put our dollar behind. Hiring on performers and celebrities is an endorsement, not just of them but of what they've done over their lives. Another convention called Days of the Dead posted on their social media a great little piece announcing that Ian Wyatt would be at their event in January, saying that he was going to be the only predator at Days of the Dead. Hi everybody, it's Kevin Spacey here, your mad monster, coming to Concord, North Carolina, February 16th through the 18th. That's right, all three days, and I'm looking forward to getting there. I also, while I got you, just want to take a moment and thank all my fans for all your support through all these years. It's meant so much to me, and I hope you can make it, because uh, it'd be nice to meet in person. And the thing about all of this is that for security reasons, Spacey was never once actually seen on the convention floor itself. He did not have a table, he did not take selfies, he did not do a Q&A. It was like he wasn't even there. They just had him locked in the back like he was the fucking Wizard of Oz for staged photographs because anything else could have exposed him to uncomfortable questions. And to that, I just gotta ask, if he isn't even going to be participating in the convention itself, why ruin your own reputation and name by having him there? Why choose to die on this hill? Because despite him not physically being seen, just him being in the building for three days lingered over the event like a haunting spirit. The vibes of this place were truly awful. Because they booked him, it resulted in many reputable vendors or guests refusing to even show up by either not booking the convention or canceling their reservation. And this drastically hurt the overall tone and the experience of the convention itself. The atmosphere was genuinely depressing. I'm not trying to be an asshole when I say this, but one of the biggest guests that they could book was Tim Capello, the featured extra from The Lost Boys that plays the saxophone that is only on screen for a few seconds. One of their other major guests was Michael Lerner, who was not Michael Myers in Halloween 6, but instead was that guy's stunt double that was only used in a few shots in the film. I've talked to both of those guys and they're really nice, and I genuinely mean no disrespect to either of them, but even they would probably agree that they are not horror A-listers. They do not draw in crowds. Because they decided to back Spacey, they really had to scrape the bottom of the horror barrel 
to get anyone to come to this thing. And despite what they would say about having record numbers, the attendance felt completely dead. It really felt like there were about half as many people as there should have been there on a normal year. I mean, we're talking about a convention that not too long ago had Art the Clown and Captain Spaulding in the same room doing a joint clown photo op. They used to have legitimate guests, and by comparison, this thing was a total joke. They only had 23 guests at the show, including Spacey. Five of them were old retired wrestlers who had nothing to do with horror. One was Taryn Manning, who basically has nothing to do with horror. They had two of the Dukes of Hazard boys. You had Tom Welling and Michael Rosenbaum from Smallville. You had Chaz Palminteri from The Usual Suspects, who was there because of Spacey. You had Tom Cavanaugh from The Flash. There were only a couple of people who actually had anything to do with horror at all, like Shannon Elizabeth. The only other big names they got were Lou Diamond Phillips, who has nothing to do with horror, and Kiefer Sutherland, who was only there for a few hours on one day. And even though I do love them, and I mean no disrespect when I say this, Felicia Rose and Kane Hodder were both also there, which I'd say this in the nicest way possible, but they're basically at every single one of these things, so them being present is neither here nor there. So you can see that by booking Spacey, they totally ruined the show that they were throwing, even being about horror because they couldn't get anyone with any major clout who was both respectable and majorly relevant besides those that I've mentioned within the genre to actually show up. Fellow horror YouTuber Cody Leach was actually also at the convention and made his own videos on his experiences with it. He's a guy that I have not historically agreed with on most things. He listed Midsummer and The Lighthouse on his worst of list of 2019, complaining that horror shouldn't be this pretentious and snooty, his words, not mine, and should focus instead on being entertaining and not trying to be cute by using art house aspect ratios. Again, his words, not mine. He also did not appreciate the homoerotic basis of the movie and complained that it was just weird for weird's sake and to me just didn't try to appreciate the film on its level. In my personal opinion, he is a deeply unserious critic and can actually be to an extent a symbol of what I want the message of this video to be about. Because if you watched his video about Mad Monster Con, you would think it was a great time, a wonderful convention. There is a clear dichotomy between our two experiences and I think there's something interesting in that. And this ties into this theory that I've had for a long time that is kind of the thesis of this video and that I think there's actually not one, but two distinct horror communities that do not overlap. One that is more concerned with writing and thinking about how our own experiences and world are reflected through art. A group that overall is less concerned with how much a movie makes at the box office and more with what it is trying to say as a work of art and how it relates to ourselves and culture as people. And then you have another that is more conservative and traditionally capital A American and is based more in basic consumerism and viewing movies strictly as entertainment and nothing else. A group that often gets angry at the very notion of subtext existing within a work of fiction and views art not as a means to express what it means to exist, but instead that sees the value of creation just within the context of how fun and experience that product is. And product is the right word here. As this side of horror is obsessed with money and defending companies, and even when putting on a mask of pretending to be left-leaning, everything that they do is in the service of capital and big business. I hate to put it in terms like this, but I think deep within the heart of horror at the moment, and the country as a whole, there's a problem of anti-intellectualism raging at people who want art to be more, or to stand for something important. A group of people yelling, just let people enjoy things, while the other side argues that we can do better we can be more, which is something we are going to get to soon, so just bear with me here. I know this is a long video. In his 33 minutes of talking about the convention and everything that happened around it, Leach fails to mention Kevin Spacey outside of a single joke about the situation over 20 minutes into the video. Kiefer Sutherland was outside in the actual hallway with his own isolated room. That's that's that, that star power right there. The only other person that had that was Kevin Spacey. He was on a different floor for completely different reasons. <laughs> but <laughs> Not only that, if we look at this footage that I shot compared to the footage that he shot, you can see that he has clearly framed his angle standing roughly at the exact same spot I was so as to not show the giant Kevin Spacey banner hanging over the lobby. At another point, he includes a table with some photographs of Spacey near the very end. But outside of that, you wouldn't even know that he had been there based on his video. And you know, I think that people who were in my line of work have a certain level of responsibility to appropriately cover the things that we choose to talk about. 
So in my opinion, making a glowing half hour long video about how cool Mad Monster is in the wake of them trying to publicly rehabilitate Spacey's image into a right wing personality at a convention held in the South, which happened within weeks after he appeared on Tucker Carlson's show, is not a very responsible use of your platform. And, you know, he did have his complaints about the convention, including talking about the outrageous parking situation in the footage where he actually walks pretty close to my car. He talked about the layout of the convention being not very professional, about the lines being disorderly, but never once does he have a single word of criticism about Mad Monster as an organization for their attempted rehabilitation of Kevin Spacey as a public figure, or the fact that he is greatly profiting off this appearance from people who are probably struggling, and honestly, probably can't or at least shouldn't afford the $300 fee that it costs to get in the room with him for maybe 10 seconds. He then goes on to say that he looks forward to going to Mad Monster Con again next year. But even if you look at some of his footage within his own video, you can just see how dead this place was. Most of my footage was taken from the busiest times of the day, but the majority of the con before noon and after 2 p.m. just felt totally empty. And the depressing visuals that he's showing in his video do not match with his glowing review. I don't want to make presumptions about Leech. I had the opportunity to talk with him that day. I saw him walking around a few times, but decided against it. So we've never actually met. But in his video, there are a couple of red flags that really scream out at me. Jane and Elizabeth were the objects of my youth. Uh, if, you, if you like really crass comedies from the 2000s before everything got all sensitive, definitely check out Sorority Boys. So to me, he is one and the same with Mad Monster, both spending content for money while ignoring the potential harm that the event itself might cause. And I'm really not trying to harm Leech's image by comparing his experience to mine. Again, I don't know the man. And to be honest, I don't actually really think that he would be that bad of a guy. Just painfully centrist, seemingly leaning a little towards liberal. Like he tweets pro-LGBT stuff, anti-racist stuff, but then he says things like, said it before and I'll say it again, right or left, the extreme political people are fucking nut jobs, and I despise a review being a political statement, and I have no clue why politics has to work its way into literally everything, but I despise the fact that it does. So, you know, a bit of a mixed bag there to me. I don't want this whole section of the video to just be about him. He's a small example of a greater problem that I think is an issue within horror, which is that the existence of centrist and liberal views mixed with a love of genre acts as a shield and breeding ground for right-wing harm within our community. Because as we will see time and time again throughout this, people who hold these liberal stances will side with conservatives over progressives at every single given opportunity, and will not criticize horror unless it is art house, and also will not stand for other people to criticize horror. You know, I myself have never once in my life described a woman as an object. I think that he should put more thought into the words that he says publicly, and how he uses his platform. But also, he genuinely seems like an alright guy. Which is the issue here. The slow creep of conservatism within all forms of art and every aspect of life is marched down a road that is paved by smiling friendly liberals. A centrist view of this event didn't even think that it was worth mentioning the act of harm that was being done here. Because we were just all there to have a good time after all, right? It is a mindset of consume the product and ask no questions about how the product was actually made or who was harmed in the making of this product. I'm in here, and if I see him, I will be very happy to see him, it's okay. but it's really okay. at the same time, I understand the allegations against him, and that's kind of weird, but Mad Monster is an amazing thing that I'm glad I'm at, and whether or not he's here doesn't stop how awesome this convention is. Again, I mean the man no ill will. Genuinely, I do not wish to harm his livelihood whatsoever by including him here. Please do not go say mean things to or about him. I will not stand for anyone who is mentioned here to be harassed in any way. Do not do that. I think as a culture, we need to learn where to actually direct our anger in constructive ways based around unity that will result in actual tangible good. Which is something I shouldn't have to outright say, but after my Halloween video last year, a lot of people sent Sean death threats and threats of violence which is absolutely 100% genuinely unacceptable. 
It is behavior that I would never under any circumstances condone or encourage, and I'm deeply ashamed of any person who did that on my behalf. It should not be our way, and the real problem in this situation is clearly those actually facilitating Mad Monster as an organization. The companies themselves are almost always the problem here. People like Leech are merely side effects of the real issue. The day after the convention ended, Mad Monster posted on their Facebook, Thank you all who joined us for a record-setting show. Your support always means a lot, but this time, it really hit home. The overwhelming amount of you that took the time to express your love and appreciation made this easily our favorite party that we've ever hosted. We will continue to throw Mad Monster Party for you, not for random autograph collectors on the sidelines, basing their attendance on the current guest lineup, not for hypocritical virtue-signaling keyboard warriors, many of which still showed up. We threw this party for the Mad Monster family that have grown with us over the years who get their tickets and hotels before the first guest is even announced. We know you're here for each other as much as for the guests and the vendors. Samantha Osborne, who worked the convention and has been employed by Mad Monster for the past two years, said on her Facebook page, This weekend, Mad Monster hosted Kevin Spacey's first ever convention appearance. Despite varied opinions going in, there were no protests, and Spacey was received warmly. As a guest, he was nothing but gracious. That's all I have to say on the matter. Witchy Woman on Twitter said, A lot of vendors are pulling out of Mad Monster Con in NC because of Kevin Spacey being on the guest list. It sucks because a lot of greats will be there. She then tagged several of the prominent guests, including John Glover, who played Riddler on Batman the Animated Series, who said, No one pulled out. It was a lovely weekend. I don't appreciate tags in this nonsense. There are real dangers in the world. The Mad Monster guest list is not one of them. She responded by saying, I know a few vendors personally, but please tell me more. To which he didn't respond. The Daily Wire in this time ran a piece defending the convention and their booking of Spacey. And you know, just my opinion here. But no horror event should ever fumble the bag so badly that you get the Nazi news force coming to bat for you. That's like a shining example of how badly you have failed your community. In the week after the convention, Kevin Spacey tweeted a video, which is something that he almost never does. In fact, since his fall from grace in October of 2017, he has only tweeted five times. This was his fifth tweet, a video thanking Mad Monster for welcoming him back into public life, saying that he had a wonderful weekend and how grateful he was for the opportunity ending by saying that he was looking forward to appearing at the next Mad Monster event. He has since announced that he is working again in Paul Schrader's next film, and little by little, he is attempting through events like Mad Monster Con to establish a base within American culture. Hey everybody, I'm just back from an incredible weekend I spent in Charlotte, North Carolina at the Mad Monster convention. It was just so much fun and I'm so grateful to all the fans who came out to say hello. Uh, your kind words meant so much to me. And, you know, people brought things also that I'd never seen before. Posters I'd never seen and memorabilia, but in particular, it was the new stuff. This uh, amazing uh, clay guy. This, me? this is for oh my you, sir. God. Jesus. Awesome. I signed a number of them all, you have number one. First of all, what is your name? I'm Barry. Barry, thank you, Barry. This is incredible. And second, how long have you been doing it? All my life. I've been in business for 30 years. It takes him yeah. about week uh, or so to, to put it together so it was really kind of him to to bring it to me as a gift i also had a chance to see old friends like chas palmentary who uh, is just a wonderful actor but he's an even better person in real life he was agent kuyan in the uh, usual suspects and he was also in a film we did together called hurdle burley which he's great in um and so it was great to catch up with him i saw uh, john glover i saw lou diamond phillips Kiefer sutherland a lot of people I just haven't seen in a long time. Uh, but also, the people who run uh, Mad Monster, they did such a great job. I mean, right from the people who have been running it for a long time, all the way down to the volunteers, so many people came by to say hello, and I felt so welcomed. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, at uh, the next one, and uh, we'll have an announcement soon about when that's going to be. So take care of yourselves. We'll see you later. I'd like to talk to you about the worst week of my life. <laughs> so, January of 2022, okay? I made a video about The Hills Have Eyes that went very badly. And I've never really spoken about this or even really addressed that it was a thing, except for maybe just a couple of times on Twitter. I guess 
when it happened, I just hope that it would eventually disappear, but it never has. And I think that we should start here by addressing the elephant in the room far too long after he arrived. So this is a brief reanalysis of Wes Craven, The Hills Have Eyes, and the internet's general response to some pretty basic things that I said about him and his work about two years ago. In the time since making that video, very often it is the case that when conservatives want to criticize me, they will go back to that and use it as a weapon. By twisting my words in very bad faith to make it look like I said something that I obviously did not intend if you had watched the video. Usually in an attempt to make me either look crazy or cartoonish or racist, or that I don't know what I'm talking about and I'm unqualified to have this job. A recent example of this happened in this past January when Mark After Dark on Twitter said, IPOS himself has said some really racist shit towards native First Nations people in his Hills Have Eyes video too. He's not one to talk. In fact, Mark After Dark has been slandering me pretty consistently now for years in relation to the Hills Have Eyes, often getting hundreds of likes every single time by either saying lies about me or really taking my words in completely bad faith. And every time that he does this, it hurts my reputation just a little bit more. These things do have a very real effect because if people say things enough times, then other people will believe it. It doesn't matter if it's actually true. He was the first that I could tell to actually tweet something negative about me in the fallout from that video's release when he said, YouTube film essayist, the cannibals in the hills have eyes are actually the good guys because they're poor and the family is everything wrong about America. They're middle class and one is a retired cop cuts to footage of January 6 storming the Capitol, which I hope you'll be able to see is taking my basic argument and contorting it to appear as ridiculous as possible, even though it did make sense within the context of the actual video. I mean, that video is an hour and 25 minutes. Reducing what I was trying to get across down to a single one sentence tweet, of course, is going to make me look like an insane person. You can literally do that with anything that anyone says, but it isn't being done in the fair spirit of argument. It isn't an actual response to what I was saying. It is lashing out like a toddler. He got 370 likes with that one. Another time to 867 likes, he said, I like IPOS videos for the most part, but this man has brain worms. His Hills Have Eyes video is the most schizophrenic far leftist ramblings I've ever heard. He said the family deserved to be raped and killed because they represented colonial USA and the Hill people are native. By my count, he has tweeted at least 10 times over the past two years about this. And that is without me actually even looking very hard. I'm sure it has happened even more than that. I have never once before now interacted with him or even acknowledged his existence. And he's often really condescending with this too. In one tweet saying that I must have forgotten my meds that day. Essentially, every single time implying that I think rape, violence, and cannibalism is literally a good thing and that I'm also a racist. Around that same time in January, an account going by Crackhead Clyde said to me, I don't get how you can show more sympathy for the violent cannibals in the Hills Have Eyes than a kid who is defending himself during a riot, or a competing YouTuber who has different opinions from you, which we're gonna get to all of this in a little bit, but the kid that he was talking about defending himself was Kyle Rittenhouse. The Hills Have Eyes is their favorite thing to use against me because it is really all they've got. And not that we should be really taking the opinions of Crackhead Clyde extremely seriously, but the issue is the army of Crackhead Clydes that will read a single tweet about you and then assume that it is true and hold that against you for years. Literally, there has not been a single week that has gone by in over two years that I didn't have somebody saying something shitty to me about that video. And I don't think that most of them have actually even watched it. And I kind of want to look at this because posting that video was a huge negative turning point in my life. And the way that that one video was received has really impacted everything around me. Before that, I was relatively comfortable financially. I could make the kinds of videos that I wanted to and have honestly struggled very badly ever since then. If you want to know why I make so many franchise videos now, it's because I still need to eat and those are the only things that ever gain any traction now. Everything else I do dies as soon as it's released. For transparency, this is a graph of my total lifetime views on my channel and this is the point where I posted The Hills Have Eyes. There is a clear delineation before and after me making that and at least from my perspective i'm not really sure if that response was entirely fair or justified i don't think that as a person i deserve that based on my performance in that one single video i understand that i am not entitled to your time whatsoever or anything like that i'm just a guy on the internet but if you stopped watching me over the public reception to that one work then i kind of want to talk about that a little bit here 
because there's not an insignificant amount of people who frequently say untrue things about me. And in the long term, it has kind of ruined my ability to make a living doing what I want to do with my own work. And all of this has been built on a misconstrued idea of what I was actually talking about. But before we get to that, let's take a look at some other movies made by Wes Craven so that we have proper context to actually talk about The Hills Have Eyes. Because Wes Craven was undeniably an extremely left-leaning filmmaker who infused that into practically all of his work. He is probably about the most leftist mainstream horror filmmaker that was ever working at his level. The dude genuinely hated most things that modern America stood for, including corporate culture the decline and failure of our systems, the harm and uselessness of the police, the damage that white culture has done to non-white cultures both within the physical boundaries of the United States but also on a global scale. You can find this subtext throughout every single one of his films. It's just an objective fact. Take Nightmare on Elm Street, a movie about a child killer who the government let go on a technicality, where the system failed them so badly that the parents of the victims have to band together to form some sort of frontier justice lynch mob because the government is so useless that they have let him slip through the cracks. So Nancy's mother, Marge, says at one point in relation to Kruger being able to walk free, well, the lawyers got fat and the judge got famous but somebody forgot to sign a search warrant in the right place and Kruger was free just like that. In the end, a teenage girl has to take down the rapist herself while the cops stand right outside on the front lawn listening to her screams, watching and going, oh gosh, oh gee, whatever are we gonna do? Which is something that is still happening in real life. And in that light, a running theme throughout every single one of Craven's Scream films is how the cops are incompetent and never once in any of the movies do they actually catch the killer. And that's not even to mention the criticisms of Harvey Weinstein in Scream 3. If you look at his 1981 follow-up to The Hills Have Eyes, Deadly Blessing, it too has a strong message on the ineffectiveness of the police, as when one of our main women protagonists is basically begging the sheriff to do something about a dangerous man instead of just sitting by and watching his bad things happen happen to innocent people, he says to her, if something happens, I won't be here in time for nothing but cleanup. Vampire in Brooklyn is kind of a strange movie, one that dares to ask the question, what if we cast Eddie Murphy and Angela Bassett to play love interest and then gave them the same haircut? And also in that it kind of doesn't really have a protagonist, which is unusual for a horror film. Whoever the protagonist is really is determined by what part of the movie that you're at. But we start with Julius, who is struggling, works a bad job, and has a deep distrust of the police, who weirdly have German shepherds. Hmm, you know, it seems like Wes Craven liked to use German shepherds as a visual code for racist cops. Anyways, he has an older relative who is sucking him dry by overcharging him and other young people to live in the apartment building that he owns, while he gets rich and does basically nothing. Where they later literally try to eat their landlord before instead forcing him to be their servant and drive them around in a stolen limo. Another instance of Craven using a cannibalism metaphor in relation to wealth and power dynamics. A movie that also includes a scene where a white woman holds a black man hostage in a park with pepper spray up to his eyes, telling him that she hates to do this because she understands what capitalism has done to black culture, but that she just doesn't feel safe seeing him in the park after dark. A total parody on the hypocritical mindset that liberals have held for decades now. It is also not the only movie that he made that primarily features an all-black cast and is based around issues that affect black people. The Serpent and the Rainbow is about an all-white imperialist American pharmaceutical company who sends a tall, white, light-haired, handsome man to try and incorporate himself into the culture of Haiti to learn their tricks of how they create Haitian zombies to then steal their old folk medicines so that they can market them and capitalize off of them. Midway through the movie at the dinner scene at the CEO's house, where they are planning and celebrating this, genuinely having a conversation about violence that they plan to enact against poor black people. Everyone who is at the table is white and the butler who serves them is black. And because he's there to steal from them, the protagonist is never able to actually immerse himself in their culture and never attempts to understand the Haitians on a spiritual level. He is a cultural leech. And just because he is the protagonist does not mean that Craven is trying to paint him as a good person, just like with the family in The Hills Have Eyes. In fact, just like The Hills Have Eyes, Craven is using Serpent and the Rainbow to show a very complicated situation where both sides have strong issues going on, as the black political antagonists of the film are using excessive violence and fear to politically control their people through police force. Everyone is painted in shades of gray, but Craven clearly does not think that our protagonist is actually a good person. The People Under the Stairs follows a black child who is being evicted because his family cannot pay their rent and his mother is dying 
dying of cancer which results in an adventure that leads him to learning that their white landlords are secretly BDSM racist serial killing incestuous siblings who got into the landlord business to be able to still inflict pain in their non-killing hours. It is not a stretch to suggest that the man who made a movie about landlords being evil racist monsters who are going to be killed by their community would have some other things to say about the systematic economic problems in America and how it relates to racial history. And clearly based on his other works, if he has a protagonist in a story that is an old white cop like in The Hills Have Eyes, he is not going to write him as if he is a good person. I'm not saying my opinions here. I am literally telling you factual information about what happens in these movies. There is this thing that the internet does where one person says something that is false but sounds believable and is tangentially related to what actually happened and then other people start to repeat it out of context and morph it and slowly escalate it until it just becomes general belief, even though it is detached from reality. And this is what I think happened here in my situation, where people somehow got the notion that I was a racist, pro-cannibal, pro-rape and sexual assault weirdo, which, you know, I find genuinely insulting. It's like some people had never heard of the concept of a metaphor before. So if we go back to my original video, okay? My basic argument was that the hill people in The Hills Have Eyes are a stand-in for any type of person who has been marginalized by the American imperial machine. Native Americans, any non-white people really, queer people, poor people, anyone who would stand in opposition to the family, whose father is a police officer, whose background is upper middle class, who are openly racist, demanding, and hostile, who also have a German Shepherd as their chosen pet. They are a family made up of racist red flags. And I discussed how the movie is about a conflict when those ideologies come into contact when a group who has had everything taken away from them and another who reaps the benefit of the taking are suddenly placed on the same level and are told to duke it out for survival. About how at the end of the day, when push comes to shove, we are all capable of great violence against one another. I do not think that that is an outrageous reading of that film. It isn't even really subtext. It's just the plot of the movie. People got extremely mad at me for recapping the plot of The Hills Have Eyes. Because genuinely, if you go back and watch that video, that is all I am doing. It is a very basic reading on Wes Craven's intended message of that film based on his own words and what he put on the screen. I'm not even saying that I agree with everything going on in the movie. I also certainly did not write the movie. And truth be told, I also think that Wes Craven is a little overrated and I'm somewhat mixed on his filmography as a whole. Thematically, I think he's great but on a basic filmmaking level, he was at times fairly weak. I was literally just talking about what Craven was trying to do in his script and how he saw the movie. That's all. Still, I started to receive comments like this. I can't imagine watching this film and coming away with the conclusion that the cannibals are secretly the good guys and the biggest tragedy is that they didn't eat the people passing through. He stabs him in the heart not to kill him but to remind him of his place. Or maybe it was just to kill the cannibal who attacked him and his family. I don't know. Just my interpretation. It's edgy takes for the sake of engagement. Love this channel, but I don't think it was actually fine that these cannibals killed, raped, and ate people who just crashed their car in the wrong spot because capitalism is bad and actually they are the good guys is the take that I would have gone with. You can defend your home without eating people. You have an extremely warped moral compass. Class this, class that, blah blah blah. I like your videos, but the commie talk is distracting and arrogant. We side with the vacationing family because they are a down on their luck group, trying to get unstuck until they're hunted by opportunistic murders who want to eat them. They're not inherently sympathetic because they're white or rich. They're sympathetic because they're the victims in the movie. Not just the victims in your meta-textual want for what you think the movie should be. The Carters win because good should triumph over evil. Jesus, Wes is spinning in his grave for an hour and 25 minutes. Woke Overthinking presents a woke critique of a B-movie lacking any intellectual heft. If I had a nickel for every time a horror channel assumes something in a film is an allegory or a metaphor, I'd be rich by now. So tiring. <laughs> I think this dude is gay or some. He can't go a video without mentioning disrespect towards them folks. Also, the hillbillies are cannibals. How are you gonna sympathize with them? Had to stop watching it 15 minutes. I think you're viewing the film through a modern woke lens and you're really stretching the themes to fit your personal bias. Really hard to take you seriously now. Just because you're a communist doesn't mean that every movie is about class struggle or social inequality. Holy cow, you make it sound like the cannibal rapists are the good guys. Gross, dude. 
typical liberal garbage. Every time I think I like this channel, this guy spews some overthought lefty garbage that takes me right out of it. So what I have gathered from this video is people who commit tragedies such as mass shootings are justified because they have been wronged by society, and society should expect innocents to suffer because of that. Oof. The over-interpretation of capitalism bad by making the literal raped, murdered, and eaten victims into the bad guys of the movie was my cue to unsub. Sorry, bud. You lost me. You went way too off the mark. I've enjoyed several of your videos, but damn, you seem to be a bit lost in this one. Your stances just seem a bit warped. And why inject politics into a movie anatomy? Social justice? I was rolling my eyes throughout. I mean, come on, man. <laughs> LOL, I've watched a few other videos of his and didn't notice his political leanings, and here's the thing. I don't actually care what they are. It's just pretty silly to inject social justice into a review of The Hills Have Eyes, LOL. Yeah, I can't help but disagree with this video. This might be your worst yet. <laughs> I despise your political analysis of this film. Calling police officers, people who put their lives on the line for a job, a symbol of oppression, shows a huge bias on your end. People are a lot more than their political affiliation, but I don't think you showcasing yours is very much appreciated by your audience. Would really appreciate it if you tried to be more impartial. <laughs> 18 minutes in and I had to stop because it really is an unwatchable video. Incredibly sad because I enjoyed a lot of the In Defense of Nicolas Cage. It really feels like night and day in terms of quality of the essay. While everyone is free to think what they want, and I really appreciate and enjoyed some of your other videos, here you're basically justifying that people should be assaulted, raped, cannibalized, based on their socioeconomic status and, dare I say, skin color. Would you have reacted the same way if the family was black? Or came from another racial background? Or is it only okay because the rich family was white? You are such a talented writer, with an impressive ability to digest a movie. But unfortunately, as so often these days, your politics tend to ruin some parts of your videos whenever you put your postmodern lens on. Sadly, you seem to be lost in a pretty bad... <laughs> Sadly, you seem to be in a pretty bad place right now. Your so-called anatomy is full of hate and cynicism. I hope you'll get better soon. <laughs> Buddy, maybe leave out the half-baked race-baiting and focus on the movie. Yeesh! I thought I was going to watch a movie retrospective, not be morally grandstanded at LMAO. This was honestly exhausting. Ah, uh, you know, you do this long enough and you kind of develop this weird, broken, detached mental thing that I'm convinced that everyone who works long-term on the internet has. And I know that that was a lot of hateful comments to read back to back to back, but I'm just trying to communicate what it is like having the never-ending barrage of the internet saying bad things to you on a daily basis that are not founded in reality. What was really distressing to me though in this time is that I slowly started to watch it leave my comments section and just became an accepted idea about me outside on the internet at large. Someone on Reddit in this time said, I like In Praise of Shadows a decent bit for horror analysis, but his video on Hills Have Eyes is such a wild case of tunnel vision that even his normally receptive audience calls him out on it across the comments section. He digs into this interpretation of the first film as a critique of modern society, where the incestuous cannibals are the real heroes and were tricked into rooting for the empty consumers trespassing on their land because they look like us. And it's just, it's just very weird. Especially in how much he refuses to address the amount of sexual assault the cannibals perpetrate. I'm all for wild interpretations of the thematic meanings of art, within reason. This goes well beyond reason. And you know, these things are half-truths. It removes all nuance regarding the use of metaphor in the film. And I know I'm including a lot of examples in this section, but I'm just trying to communicate exactly how in this situation I said one thing, and then it got misconstrued as another that slowly eroded people's view in my writing and their trust in me, which has made the past two years a very dark time in my life. And on the notion of refusing to address something, that is something that gets said a lot about critics and YouTubers in general, that if something wasn't directly mentioned then it must be obviously a refusal to mention it or a massive oversight that must be pointed out by the commenter. Neither of which are true in this instance or in most instances that that assertion is ever made. You don't work on a project for a hundred hours and then just accidentally forget to include something. I assure you that thought was put into the words that I was saying. 
I incorporated all forms of violence into one for that video because the metaphor of the movie is about aggression and revenge, whether that be sexual, outright physical, or even eating the victims. All of them to the hill people are expressions of forms of revenge, one and the same. It literally makes no sense to talk about them as if they were three different things within that context, because as far as the movie is concerned, all of the violence falls under the same blanket of metaphorical rage. It would only take up time to not actually end up saying anything that I hadn't already said. And if I went down a list and addressed every single act of violence individually, that just would be pointless. And also, it isn't me saying that I think that these things are good in real life. Obviously. We are talking about fiction here. The Hills Have Eyes never happened. Wes Craven made that up. These are not real people. And I know I normally don't have to go that basic with what I'm saying, but in this instance, I guess it does have to be said. Because near weekly for over two years, at least one person has insinuated to me that I supposedly think people's flesh should literally be eaten off their bodies because they can afford a camper. And I won't name names. But the thing that really hit me the hardest is that when I decided to stop reading comments and just tried to distract myself by scrolling on Twitter and on my For You page, I found a thread of mutuals openly making fun of me for my failure of the video amongst themselves, just openly in public. Some of them using words like idiot and stupid, many of which I could tell had not actually watched the video based on what they were saying. They were genuinely just calling me dumb without trying to meet me on my level of what I was trying to say, instead just believing what other people were saying about me. And that was so hurtful that I can't even fully communicate it to you. To see this notion escape the comments section, which, you know, it's YouTube, sometimes it can be a little bit out there, into the more real digital life on the internet and Twitter and beyond, to where even people who knew me were making fun of me in post that the algorithm recommended to me was the lowest point in my career. Again, I won't say who they are, I don't want people to get mad at them for this, but I still remember, and to be honest, I will always see those people differently from now on. And if I met them in person, I would never be more than just cordial. I would never be their friend, and I'm usually not like that. I decided then that I was never going to acknowledge that this was happening. I was just going to go on about my life, keep making videos, and hope that things would be fine. But they weren't. They never really were again after that for me. Like I said, this never actually stopped happening. It is still going on to this day. It keeps happening, continuing to mutate and escalate to where now people are openly making fun of me about the Hills Have Eyes to my face in spite of being totally detached from the reality of what was even said in that video. They don't even treat me like a person. Recently, I said something related to the Cherokee on Twitter near where I live, which is something we are going to get to here in a little bit. And somebody said to me, Hi, I live in Oklahoma and am a Native American. Go fuck yourself. Like, what do I even do with that? I've never once in my life said something negative about Native Americans, but there are a whole group of people who treat me with open hostility over a perceived belief that I said something awful, when all I did was talk about something that somebody else had said. Another example for you is when one woman last year said, He is up his ass and has been for several videos now, and he apologized rape and media as art. What do you expect of someone who calls himself an artist on every video? And now, you know, I normally have a rule for myself of refusing to engage in purposefully combative comments, but this one made me really mad. And I said back to them, I can assure you that I have never done that. That accusation is disgusting to me, and putting those words in my mouth is in extremely bad faith. To which she said, I wouldn't make that accusation if it wasn't something you have done. Either way, you sadly became full of yourself, mourning over your poor artist's soul and drowning in self-pity. And slowly, some people got the idea that I was just some crazy person with outrageous fringe views who shouldn't be taken seriously by this unjustifiable snowball of a reaction to me saying that maybe Wes Craven liked to write horror and metaphors and enjoyed using visual shorthand symbols within his work, which is what most people who write horror do, and that maybe he used Native American visual codes as his narrative symbols, which was very heavy-handed but also was commonplace in the 1970s. I said nothing that was either groundbreaking or new or outrageous or even original there. If anything, I was doing a basic recap of the history of criticism that has already been said a thousand times before me, just to get past the first movie so that I could talk about the sequels, which is what I do in basically every single franchise video. That is the format. If you go back and look at all of those videos, 
They start with a basic overview of the first movie, followed by a more in-depth coverage of the less talked about sequels. That is why I make those videos. You can't say anything new about the Texas Chainsaw Massacre that hasn't already been said, but you could probably have a few new original ideas about the third and fourth movies. I used to hit 200 to 400,000 views per video, and now I'm hitting 50 to 100,000 most of the time, saying the exact same message that I used to say back then. But now I think with more skill than I used to have, with higher production values, and now, every time I make a video, the comments are often swamped with people still living off that meme of an idea, who only show up to say mean things about me and leave that all started with The Hills Have Eyes. I used to not have that happen. If you go look, literally there is a hostile comment on every single video now within maybe two to three minutes of posting a new video. Say if you were to go back and look at my recent video on blood tea and red string, within a minute of the video coming out, a man had posted, I'm just here to see how long it takes him to whine about the racist patriarchy. To which someone else said, if you dislike his videos so much, why do you watch and comment on them instead of watching something you actually enjoy? To which he said in return, cause I'm a dick. This meme of an idea has directly impacted my work, my sense of self, and the videos that I am able to make. And I don't really think that that's fair. There was a month last year where I only made $500 in ad revenue. I can't live off that. The amount of times that I've almost had to stop making videos since then has been almost monthly. I've barely been able to keep this afloat. I've paid my rent late most months for the past year. The cruel and untrue things that you say about another person do in fact have direct impacts on them and the way that people culturally see them. It's why I've pushed my Patreon so much in the past year even though I know it's annoying as fuck to do. Because it is literally the only resource that is keeping this thing going after what happened. And you could say there's other contributing factors that led to the decline over time. It is true that views have gone down for everyone. But if you look at the hard data, there really is a clear line here with The Hills Have Eyes. I had just come off of one of my biggest hits ever with In Defense of Nicolas Cage. And then my next video after Hills still to this day only has 73,000 views. And I just personally believe that there has to be something that caused that kind of shift. And you know, I know that people have the right to say whatever they want about me, and that maybe it is foolish for a creator to try and fight back against a public response. I have said many times that once you release something, that it is public and no longer fully yours, and I still believe that. But at the same time, I do think that a conversation around a work or topic can be wrong or even misguided, which I obviously think happened here. I think it is within my right to talk about this on my own channel. And if you have said these things about me or to me, that is totally within your right to do. But I do want to ask you to consider why you're actually still saying them to me still two years later. What point are you trying to make besides baseless general cruelty? Are these your own genuine original thoughts and criticisms that you have based on my actual words and things that I have done? Or maybe did you read something about me two years ago that you thought was funny and that was not actually true and have latched onto a meme that was not based in fact that said that I'd become some kind of racist, pro-rape, pro-cannibalist extremist? I have always and will always speak on the idea that horror is about love and that this is all about love. If you somehow took away that I actually think that it's a good idea for people to be eaten alive, then I don't know what to tell you. We are just operating in totally different realities. We don't speak the same language. I would argue that maybe you are the one who has changed in their values and not myself. Or that maybe you haven't thought critically about what you were reading online, about other people. People often say to me when talking about my Hills Have Eyes videos, that I used to not be like that, and that they liked my older work before that, often citing my Return to Oz one, which is always very funny to me because I talk about Gilded Age capitalist rot and the benefits of communism and the tragedy of the genocide of the Native Americans in that video. In fact, I feel like whether it was my video on witches or the treatment of women historically, my video on Lovecraft and queerness, Bekshinsky and the Holocaust, horror comics and government censorship and attitudes towards sexism, racism, and violence in the 1950s, that my views have never actually changed. Which I think is the necessary thing needed to be a good critic. Perspective. You have to be able to clearly articulate your personal perspective and values in life and in art to do this job. And on that front, I have not changed since I started doing this. I've gotten better at expressing those ideas, but the core has always remained intact. All of my most popular videos back then were just as leftist as the type of content that I do now. The only thing that has changed is the conversation and culture around them, where now I get comments like, yeah, this channel is really good, but the wokeness is all over most recent videos and really is super distracting and yes, disappointing. Can you make anything without going on and on about irrelevant modern social justice shit? These videos have always been the same. If you say these things about me, 
then please revisit the older ones that you like before. You'll find that they say the exact same things as the new ones that you hate now. I was sitting in a doctor's office two years ago now, mentally dealing with everything that was going on, believing that my career was over, reading comments about what people were saying about me, and just generally, you know, feeling pretty bad about myself. When I read something by a Reddit user going by the name John Latour, who made me so happy that I actually cried sitting there in public reading that, because I felt like it was the first time that someone had publicly seen and understood the situation that I was in, and saying that they understood what I was going for and that my treatment had not been fair. One person had said about me, he really is amazing when he can keep from white knighting for women and minorities. When he does that, he starts misinterpreting shit just to shoehorn things into whatever agenda he is trying to push. I lost it when he was trying to defend the mutants from the Hills Have Eyes as representative of the minority underclass and that we should actually sympathize with the horrific rapist monsters. Like, I highly doubt that was the point of those movies at all. To which, John calmly responded, if you want to watch horror movies for what they are on the surface level of tension, scares, and kills, that's totally fine. But tons of horror movies are deserving of a more contextual analysis, and many had filmmakers who went into those films with those intentions. And there's nothing wrong if you don't want to subscribe to a director's views or intentions either, and have your own. If you listen to the commentary on The Hills Have Eyes as well as Last House on the Left, Craven pretty clearly sought to make a statement with those two films. Here are some quotes directly from Craven. When we were doing this, I was always thinking of the whole third world rage against the US and white western society. Jupiter's speech that he gives to the father's head was basically written from that perspective. I'll watch your cars rust out. It was almost anticipation of the 9-11 rage of other people against us, that we can't imagine they would be as wild and as vicious as they are. I was so struck by how, on one hand, you have this feral family that's killing people and eating them. But if you look at it, they weren't doing anything that much worse than civilization did when they caught them. And I just thought, what a great kind of A-B of culture. How the most civilized can be the most savage, and how the most savage can be civilized. I used the theme in a more conscious way with Hills. I constructed these two families as mirrors of each other. I found it very interesting to look at ourselves, to think of ourselves as having the capacity for not only great good, but also for great evil. Craven pretty explicitly does not view either sides as heroes. His goal was basically to strip one side of all of their material and civilized possessions, to show that we are both capable of the same brutality. Let's not forget how we are really introduced to Bob once they are actually standing with Bob saying, 25 years I'm a cop and the worst goddamn precinct in Cleveland. In words, shoot arrows at me and hillbillies throw dogs off the roof at me. I'm even shot on two separate occasions by my own men. But none of these bastards ever come as close to killing me as my own goddamn wife and her goddamn roadmaps and her wrong turns and her goddamn hysterical screaming. That doesn't sound like a hero to me. Anyways, my whole point is that nobody is wrong for how they watch horror movies. If you watch them because you like the thrill or seeing sweet kills, gore effects, or because you appreciate what some of these films are trying to say about society and how they can turn a mirror towards us. Horror has always rode the line between entertainment and a reflection of our own sociological fears. And that's why the genre is great because it has a lot to offer all of us. Needless to say, I also recommend In Praise of Shadows and hope everyone here has a great day. And John, I don't know you. But if you're watching this, I just want to say thank you. Because I was in a really dark place in that time period. And what you said there, I know you never thought that I would actually read, but I did. And your words mattered to me. It made such a difference for me that I still think about it. It is still one of the most important things that a stranger has ever said to me about my work. And it came to me at a time when I was in a really rocky place. And I needed you to hear that. So, thank you. In March of this year, Late Night with the Devil was released to theaters which came with a fair share of controversy. Normally this would be a film that would make some buzz and then be quickly forgotten about by most non-horror people. But Late Night with the Devil ended up with several major articles written about it in the trades because of its use of supposedly three AI generated title cards that appeared both in the trailer as well as in the film itself. The number three has been thrown around a lot, and I don't know if that's ever actually been confirmed. As far as I can tell, that number was stated by one of the directors in an interview, and it seems as if the production team may have been trying to minimize the actual extent that AI was used in their process. This was the narrative that they started, once people got mad at them. And I myself have gone through the film and would argue that there's closer to an upwards of maybe 10 or so questionable images throughout the movie. 
but for the purpose of this, we will just say that it was three pictures. As you can well imagine, there were a lot of people within the horror community who pretended that this was either not a very big deal or wasn't unprecedented behavior, and had many excuses as to why this wasn't good, but also why we should still reward their behavior with our money. BJ Colangelo said, Based on the style, the AI was clearly experimented with around the time everyone was sharing their AI profile pics, before we had the widespread, hey, this is bad convo. And they should have replaced it in the years since. I hope they do the right thing and swap those shots. But I've not seen the movie, so I have no idea how easily, quickly, they'd be able to do that in an edit. And unlike a multi-billion dollar company using AI for title cards, I have no idea if they have the money to do so. Richard Newby said, seems highly unnecessary and I don't like AI, especially when artists are looking for work. But also, I'm not going to boycott an indie movie and the work of everyone else for what amounts to 20 seconds of AI title cards, because that doesn't help artists either. Sorry. To this, Barbara Crampton said, agreed. Brett Gallman said, AI generated imagery, it's not art, is a scourge to creativity that has the potential to harm the film industry. But I'm not comfortable with dismissing all the work people put into Late Night with the Devil otherwise, especially those who had nothing to do with the decision. It is deeply disappointing that they went this route and didn't course correct during the past year, but I can't abide the logic of a boycott on behalf of artists that would ultimately just harm the artist anyways. Feels like a live and learn situation, remember those? And if anyone does think a boycott is more productive, then more power to them. I can respect having a hard line stance on this issue, so long as it doesn't come with a heavy dose of self-righteousness and condensation. Jamie Jurak said, This sucks, but I want to add to the chorus of people explaining that it was made two years ago, before a lot of us realized that AI art is bad moving forward. I think projects that use AI should be boycotted, but this indie horror deserves a little grace due to the timeline. The Real Matt C said, Still going to watch the Satanic Talk Show movie. Sorry, it's been recommended by friends who've seen it way too much. It looks awesome, and to be honest, yeah, AI sucks. But I'm not against low-budget projects using it in small doses like this. Last example I'll use right here, but there were many others. Salem Alexandria actually got shamed into apologizing for suggesting that people shouldn't go see the film when she tweeted, Maturity is accepting wrong. After having people educate me on the timing in my DMs, while I'm still against AI in the creative space when it comes to creatives being replaced, they did this at a time when everyone was having fun with AI, and with it being an indie film, having to pay the talent they did have. An all-out boycott of the film is a bit extreme. Okay, so first of all, that era that Colangelo and others is referring to really is in the dolly mini days. And by the time that more complex images like this were being created, it was pretty well established that this was very wrong behavior. The Wild West period of AI was really only generously a few weeks there, maybe. But in actuality, probably actually more like just a few days. That the argument that AI was just a fun little thing that existed before people started to seriously talk about it. And these images were made well beyond that, as you all probably well know. Saying otherwise is revisionist history. And if you really believe and think that this usage is okay, because everyone was supposedly doing it, then that speaks more on you than anything else. Because it shows that you were not listening to artists who were essentially quite vocal about the situation near immediately. This was, pure and simple, a way to cut corners and test the waters on how much audiences would tolerate the slow removal of creative people in the creative process. In the making of films on all levels, there is no other way to look at this that is ethical. And in the weeks following, other companies started to do the same, such as A24 and their horrible Civil War posters. Now, for full transparency, I myself did post one single tweet that was positive about AI, which was clearly when it was still in the Doll E mini phase, when it was just a strange curiosity, and when in the days following I listened to the conversation and realized how harmful this thing was, I never did that again, and have never excused a large company using it to not pay people. It really is that easy. Secondly, of course they had the money to pay for real title cards. They just decided not to. What do you think this is? How much do you think art actually costs? Anyone who thinks this can genuinely only have that idea because they don't know any visual artists themselves. This narrative is insane and probably disingenuous on their part. 
critic Rebecca Johnson said, It is disappointing that they used AI artwork, and a shame that they didn't hire an artist. That being said, I would be more disappointed if it were a big movie with an unlimited budget. This is an indie flick with a limited budget. People are acting like this was one of those fake movies that gets made for $500 and then dumped onto Amazon Prime. They could have paid for those assets for the same amount of money or less than they would have for a single advertisement for the film. The movie was produced by Roy Lee, who also produced movies like The Grudge, The Ring, The Departed, The Strangers, The Lego Batman Movie, It Chapter 1 and Chapter 2, Barbarian, Bates Motel, The Exorcist TV Show, Doctor Sleep, Godzilla vs. Kong, and Godzilla Kong The New Empire, among like 50 other things that you've heard of. It was distributed to movie theaters around the entire country. Do you genuinely think that they would not be able to come up with a couple hundred extra dollars in the proposed budget if that was what was needed to complete the movie? Like, he can find the finances for this level of CGI destruction, but a JPEG is going to break the bank? To imply that you think they couldn't spare a few hundred on additional art is either purposefully dishonest or is willingly ignorant. And anyone who played into that false narrative that this was just, you know, the little old movie that couldn't do no better makes me question your critical thinking skills, as a writer as well as your just motives within all of this. This was released on a thousand screens around the country theatrically. For context on the number of screens that movies tend to get by their size, Knives Out had about 3,000 screens, and Uncut Gems had about 2,000 screens. So while it is on the smaller side, to pretend that this was something that is virtually impossible to watch legally and has no chance of making its money back is very disingenuous. And also, Everyone who worked on the crew of the movie already got paid for their work, so not seeing this is literally only screwing over the production people in charge, who decided that this was a good idea. Our support of art has to be conditional. These things have to be a hardline issue. Just because they made a small horror film does not mean that they are automatically deserving of access to our money as audience members. And lastly, for context, in my Courage the Cowardly Dog video, I had four excellent title cards made by the artist Dr. Grambo. So, one more than what the directors say appeared in Late Night with the Devil. And that cost me $50 each. We aren't talking about an insane amount of money here. That is just the cost of a few tickets to your movie. If my YouTube channel, which as we just covered has been failing for two years now, can afford to hire artists, then I guarantee you that a feature film production attached to Shudder that is owned by AMC could spare a few hundred for some assets. <laughs> Let's not be silly here. Weirdly enough, Flying Lotus initially got mad at me for criticizing the film, saying, Did you shell out a few hundred bucks? Do you know the right artist capable of making said imagery for a few hundred with their schedule? There's no nuance in this conversation at all. Y'all just want to gang up on something. Probably will never make a feature film ever. To which I said, I actually did pay a few hundred dollars for the title cards to be made by an artist for my video in December. They turned out great and I was proud to show them off. If my channel can afford it, a movie production certainly can. But that interaction from my perspective, even though it started out a bit strong with heated emotions on both sides, became more level-headed as it went on. And I'd like to think that we ended in a good place where we still disagreed but were no longer kind of adversarial to each other. and ultimately agreed on who the real enemy is in this situation, which is the large companies pushing this kind of technology. We ended by sending love to each other, and that was genuine. I love his work. I think that he's super interesting as an artist, and I really do respect him. All of this is about love and community. It's about talking with each other and working with each other and making cool shit. The whole reason I'm making this video is because I want people to think about how they talk with each other and how they engage in art and the world around them and how to show respect if people have issues with something. I think if we had broad education related to media literacy, a lot of these things wouldn't have to happen. Horror author Amanda Woomer said during this, Hot take. This film has been at festivals for a year, which means production was two years ago. The AI debate only started last year. Prior to that, people were playing with it. By our standards today, it's shitty. But I won't screw over artists from two years ago. I'm still going. Nathan Botox said in response, I can't stand the art justice warriors who have been crying about this. They are acting like the entire movie is fake. 
To which Woomer responded, and now they're going out of their way to screw over a small indie movie that lots of artists, writers, and actors did work on for the sake of three AI images that were then edited. I don't see the logic. At Little Leah 78 who describes herself as a one-woman creative agency, full-time smartass, and harlot of horror, said to this, Honestly, people don't understand how films are even made or the budgets that go into them, or that lots of people use AI in everyday life and don't even realize it. There's def a time and a place for the technology. To this, I would argue that she herself does not know how movies are made, because in the time before the release, the filmmakers could have very easily read the room and changed the images after the backlash from the trailer, and they still decided not to. Probably because they knew the movie would get more attention if they left it in and caused a discourse around the film. Movies are getting tweaked all the time in the final weeks up to release. That is just very normal behavior. And it was a deliberate intention to not do that here, probably for the attention that it brought to the project. And if it is a budget thing, <laughs> again, if your movie can't spare a couple hundred dollars, then it either isn't a real movie or you need to fire your accountant. Filmmaker Aaron Kuntz said, Indies rarely have the budget to hire multiple artists. It's usually three or four art leads that source everything. They're overworked and underappreciated. If over two years ago one of them used an AI image, that's not taking away a job. It's giving them time to breathe. Which, you know, I also think is the wrong way to go about this. Like, let's pretend that we literally don't have any spare money in this scenario. Let's say we're in some bizarre deep hole in the ground in the middle of nowhere where no money exists. If I were in that situation on a very small production as a director and my art team was overworked, I would either find some free stock images and have some fun in Photoshop, or I would just make the art myself or I would call in a favor. And if none of that worked out, I'd just scrap the idea if it were, you know, too much. There's so many options they could have done here. And all of this ultimately was done over a movie that was just okay. I had an all right time watching it. There are parts that I would say were good, but it is a solid six or so out of 10, if that. A decent but very forgettable movie that fails to deliver on its very basic premise, that desperately was in need of at least one or two more passes at the script before they started shooting it. I knew exactly what I was in for as soon as the movie started, and I could already tell that the script needed some extra work badly. When at the beginning of the late night talk show, the host only tells one joke in his opening monologue before he moves on to sit down behind his desk to interview the guest. And the reason that is the way that it is, is because jokes are hard to write. And the writers either didn't bother to come up with any, or they couldn't actually come up with anything that was funny. Which, if you're going to be making a horror movie about a talk show, then you need to actually have some joke writers. Because without that, you are totally failing to emulate your chosen setting. The band never plays music despite holding instruments. It commits the cardinal sin of found footage by having actual traditional movie scenes done with traditional filmic style, interspersed while they're on commercial break, that breaks the foundation of the form, stuff like that. Visually at times, it was mostly fine, but everything else that they're trying to do reads as totally inauthentic. Compare this to how this same setting was achieved in Miss Maisel and you can see what I'm talking about. And I know that I'm comparing two different productions that had wildly different budgets from each other. But you should really write for the money that you think you're going to be able to get. Sometimes shooting for the stars is a bad idea. To me, real takes on TikTok had the absolute worst take on this issue, funny enough. When he said, this type of holier than thou bullshit is obnoxious on so many levels. A very particular brand of Reddit bro throwing a tantrum right now over one AI generated image making its way into late night with the devil. If you're going to say that this is a reason not to pay to support a movie or to not watch it, then I think what you're doing is very counterproductive. This is a low budget, incredibly well made passion project. You get a great low budget horror film made with passion and you're going to cancel it because of your holier than thou attitude? When you boil it down, I just find this kind of discourse to be dumb, performative, and unnecessary. Is AI something to be aware of and keep an eye on as the years progress? Yes, absolutely. This could take away a lot of jobs from a lot of people, but this is not one of the examples to act so hurt about. By all means, go after studios and filmmakers when they give us schlock. 
when they throw trash at us and expect us to eat it up. But this is not one of those times, and this is misdirected and silly rage. Uh, the film would end up making $10 million at the box office in its short run, and would be shown on Shutter soon after that, with the images still exactly as they were, unchanged, even though they now had millions of dollars to fix the issue. In response to all of this, and when asked if he intended to use the box office success to retroactively hire an artist to replace the AI-generated images, now that they had a lot of money, one of the directors, Colin Cairns, said, I don't know. If someone higher up thinks that's the thing to do, we'll have that conversation. But the film is the product of a really grueling production, writing the whole process, and we're very proud of the movie, as is everyone who worked on it, and it's resonating. This huge couple of weeks that it's had, we know it works. And to go and change that just because some people have been outraged, and I think outraged by some exaggerated claims and frankly quite a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding, I think no. I don't think that we should start caving into that. The film is a production of its given circumstances, and who's to say in five years time there won't be something else that somebody has a problem with, and well, oh, we've got to change that. I think the film is what it is, and stands on its own two feet. Audiences mostly seem to be enjoying it, which is what we're in it for. Horror has a modern internal problem with conservatism, and fandom-based centrism that excuses that conservatism and reinforces its power. We don't have enough time here to do the entire history of the genre. That would obviously take a while. And this video is already quite long, and we have more ground to cover still. But horror is an intrinsically left, punk, anti-establishment, counter-cultural art form that is primarily concerned with social issues and pushing boundaries beyond what is deemed acceptable by traditional, more conservative, polite society. There's no other way that you can rationally look at it and still exist within reality. Just about every major work of iconic horror has had a leftist message to what it is trying to say at its heart about the human condition. And the people and the tastemakers at the forefront of the genre pushing it forward from the very beginning up to modern day have always been transgressive artists, looking to express something that they otherwise couldn't in more mainstream outlets. People of color, women, and queer people have often found a home in the genre, where they otherwise might not have in other art forms. It is not a place for hateful ideas, and it never has been. Night of the Living Dead obviously tackled issues of race. The Twilight Zone did the same. You could say similar things about basically every big work of horror fiction. Like, this is just basic stuff. Horror 101. All the big names in the modern era of horror film, Romero, Craven, Carpenter, Hooper, Flanagan, Cronenberg, Lynch, Waters, De Palma, Barker, Eggers, Gordon, Del Toro, Dante, and Peele, among many, many, many others, are all moderately left in their thought processes when approaching story and how they're concerned with social issues within their films. Now, not all of them are communist left. But still, the argument stands that they're all pretty left to be making mainstream successful movies within America. Mary Shelley was queer, Oscar Wilde was queer, Lovecraft was almost certainly queer, James Whale was queer, Bram Stoker was queer. The very foundations and grammar of the art were constructed by queer people, about queer people, and as an art form. It really only works when being used as a mirror to reflect social issues, about how people of lower class are being affected by those with power. Horror can't really function when it's being bent into a tool that punches down. It's why Saltburn fundamentally does not work as a film, where we find these fabulously rich people who were living their best lives, only to have their undoing befall upon them by the hands of a weird little queer freak who buries into their estate like a parasite. Horror is intrinsically designed to question authority and critique power, and does not work to channel cruelty. The very act of creating horror fiction has for decades been an act of protest and critique. For more examples, watch practically any of my other videos. We don't have enough time for it here. It just is what it is. And from there, we're gonna move on. Folks constantly talk about the political undertones in my videos, but horror is an unabashedly political genre that is concerned directly with issues facing the current society. And if you're in the horror space and you don't regularly acknowledge this foundation as a challenge to power, then I just assume you're in it for the money, or that you don't actually care, or you're just really bad at your job. And if that makes you uncomfortable or upset that I often do that in my videos, that's probably a good thing. This is the intended purpose of horror as a concept. It is designed to provoke, to question, to hold accountable, to breed and facilitate conversation. It drives me crazy to see anti-intellectual stances from people within genre spaces who say, why can't a movie just be a movie? Why does everything have to have meaning or stand for something? Can't we just have fun anymore? The best horror is fun. 
It does both. Fun and smart are not mutually exclusive concepts to each other, and it has always been that way. And it is crucially important to acknowledge that and understand our history if you're going to then apply that history to the works of the art form in the world that we live in today. If you are far right and think that I'm wrong, genuinely your favorite horror filmmaker would not only hate the things that you stand for, but chances are they probably also made a movie about it. Now, on a surface level, one could see horror as anti-women or pro-violence or, you know, kind of the things that I was accused of in the last chapter because of the nature of the art form. Which, yeah, all of that stuff exists. That's all out there. But I think if you're viewing the entire art form that way, that is a bit of a reductive and simplistic view of what these films are typically actually trying to say about how we should all treat each other as people. We have to remember that depiction in art is not necessarily an endorsement of what is being shown. I mean, looking at Lloyd Kaufman movies on the surface, you would think that they were practically directed by a Klansman. But if you actually pay attention to him as a person and as an artist, and what he's trying to say and the types of people that he allows on the screen, and also the people who are in his direct circle, then you do start to kind of realize that Troma has always been kind of one of the most radical and progressive, nearly anarchist film companies operating at that level within American cinema. A group that revels in bad taste on a John Waters scale, but similar to him, does so not out of hate. At least, not hatred of common people. I mean, just listen to some of these quotes that he gave in an interview in New York back in 2001 with Roel Hannon on how Troma always approaches story as a company. We take the position that there is a conspiracy of elites, the labor elite, the bureaucratic elite, and the corporate elite. These three elites conspire to suck dry the little people of Tromaville of their economic and spiritual capital. In the United States, labor leaders get salaries of a million or two million dollars a year, while the union members are working like animals for next to nothing. Government officials like the Secretary of State or the Environmental Commissioner, they put in their three years of service and then they move on to the big corporations where they make ten million dollars a year. It's all fixed. On top of that, they're just preaching to us. I thought it was important to start Terra Farmer with some brutal moments, because to a certain extent, that is what American society is. Brutal. The reality of American life is constant racial and sexual violence. My movies are a reflection of that. From the Toxic Avenger on, we have been involved in fighting hatred and violence and the puritanical dictatorship in America. He then goes on to talk about how America is fueled around forming smokescreens of false issues, taking moral stances on things that politicians don't actually care about so that they don't have to do any actual real work. Half the world is starving and we're having discussions about abortion. It's horseshit. None of this sounds like the words of a hateful man to me. Angry, yes, but not hateful. And there's a big distinction there, where hateful is the act of lashing out undirected and uneducated, but anger is channeled positive energy. And you can feel that throughout Terra Firmer, which is one of the most outwardly mask-off works of leftist horror filmmaking in the past two decades, which, if you've not seen it, you really should. And to view horror as hateful or overtly negative or simple-minded, I think fails to recognize what it can do as a form of expression, criticism, and protest and what it has always been able to do for those things. But when I talk about horror being left, what I actually mean is that it has historically been used as a tool most successfully by left filmmakers. Horror and film in general, like all forms of art, are merely tools that can be wielded by anyone to produce art and expression that can then be experienced by others. And often it is the case too that conservatives produce works of horror as well. It isn't something that only the left does. There's this dangerous myth that has been cultivated by the left that conservatives can't make art, that they don't understand people on a very basic level, that they're not funny. Norm MacDonald was a staunch conservative. David Zucker, who made Airplane, is a Republican and has specifically made films for the Republican Party. John Hughes was a Republican and made Ferris Bueller's Day Off as a show of his idealization of what the freedoms of Reaganism could do for us all. Milos Forman, who made One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and Amadeus, was staunchly anti-communist. Sam Raimi, the director of the Evil Dead films and the Spider-Man films, is a Republican who donated to both George W. Bush campaigns and has been alleged to support Trump very much in private, but just doesn't talk about it because he knows that people wouldn't like it. Quentin Tarantino is a Zionist and lives in Israel. Roy Frumkus, 
who wrote the film Street Trash, has been accused of sexual harassment directed at his students for decades. I mean, hell. David Lynch said at one point, Trump could go down as one of the greatest presidents in history. A statement that he would later retract, but arguably as much as I love him, a great deal of his work does have some conservative values to them, even though he clearly believes in the spiritual nature and goodness inherent in the average human. Something that Alan Moore famously argued once that people really did not like. Trust me when I say that conservatives are perfectly capable, just like anyone else, of being funny and learning how to produce art. Those things are skills that anyone can do. To think otherwise would be hopeful at best, but in practice is dangerous, and allows the slow infiltration of conservative beliefs into places that they should not be allowed, because it creates this shield that allows us to ignore their red flags. The idea that conservatives cannot make good art needs to be abandoned, because it leaves us in a position to where we underestimate their potential to spread their messaging. I would argue that despite the face of horror journalism and horror authors being more diverse than they ever have been, on the side of horror cinema, we are living through the past 20 years of being some of the most conservative in the history of the genre. And within horror cinematic fiction at large, this has been a gradual slow creep. As there's always been some figures producing art within the medium, obviously, who hold right-wing beliefs. But more and more, I will sit down to watch a horror film and be blindsided by what it is actually trying to communicate to its audience. And I hate that more than just about anything when it comes to film. This myth that every movie that is ever made that is either horror or is a small independent production should be immune from basic criticism, that we would level at any other work of media needs to be abandoned for this reason. We do not need to support every single small movie. Horror people love to make fun of what they view as basic lesser MCU fans, with their bizarre vanilla culture worship and their crusade against Martin Scorsese. But then we'll turn around and basically do the exact same thing themselves, just on a battlefield that is being fought on a smaller scale. A mindset of consume, 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 without even thinking to question how the sausage gets made. Just lacking any sense of moral fiber in their bones. A lot of them just genuinely have zero conviction most of the time. And there are films that I will never review here because of that. Such as when I do my History of Werewolf Movies video, I will not mention The Wolf of Snow Hollow, because the writer, director, and star, Jim Cummings, has been very vocally in favor of AI-generated imagery multiple times. I don't think anyone should support his work going forwards, and this is the last time that I will ever publicly acknowledge him. Horror is a mirror. It is countercultural. It is punk. It is that way, and it always has been. But if we are using punk as an example, then to further that example as a subculture, they have always had to deal with Nazi punks trying to infiltrate their spaces and co-op their style and language to try and distill a message of hate through their mouthpiece that it was not designed for. As a community, they have worked for decades to build a set of tools and understanding to deal with those issues internally. And I'm here today to argue that we should be doing the same thing within our horror spaces. But there is this psychological issue that we have to get over first, which is that people are not willing to criticize others within the genre space when they are doing wrong, and are not willing to criticize aspects of horror films either out of social politeness, because it is a small community, or more frequently, allow their values to take second place behind their love of genre, or out of financial benefit. All three of these are an issue that we need to address because they allow active harm to be transgressed and to be continued. To explain this, I think it would help if we look at the film Abigail, that is not a conservative horror film, but the conversation around it helps to demonstrate this point. The film is about a group of hired goons who infiltrate the home of a wealthy businessman to kidnap his daughter to hold her for ransom in an abandoned mansion outside of town, where group tensions begin to rise as they start to doubt what they have done, and they begin to infight as they suspect that the mafia has sent a hitman to the mansion after them to retrieve the girl. And then near the end of the film, we actually learn that the girl herself is the hitman man, and that she's also a vampire, who has orchestrated the whole thing and the climax is her hunting the remaining team members who have to fight for their lives. Okay, so the only problem with this is that the vampire reveal is shown on the poster and is in the trailer and is in the name of the film. You literally cannot know that this film exists without also knowing that it is about a vampire girl. This is clear in every aspect of its marketing. You don't have films named Laurie, Clarice, Nancy, or Sydney, but you do have films named Chucky, Frankenstein, Dracula, Megan, Leatherface, It, Jason, Freddy, and Carrie. If a first name is ever in a horror title, historically that is to delineate who the monster is in the film. Every single piece of the film's marketing did not care if you actually had a good experience at the movies or not. They just wanted your money, and that's an issue. Now, 
I promise that this video is not going to turn into a list of people who annoyed me on Twitter, but to explain this concept, we're going to have to talk about Twitter for a short while longer. So, people, including myself, began to complain that Abigail was not fun to watch, because you already knew how it was going to end because you'd seen the trailer. Which I think is a valid argument. Not all movies are ruined by spoilers, but certainly some can be. You don't watch an Ozu movie for the plot. But if the work is designed to be a mystery, then you do. Abigail has several references throughout to Agatha Christie. It is clearly designed for you to initially not know what is going on here. It is steeped in the aesthetics of mystery films. And showing that Abigail is a monster in the trailer would be like showing the mask reveal of a ghost face in a Scream movie, or even more similarly, including Gabriel from Malignant in those trailers. It would ruin what is designed to clearly be a fun whodunit film whose base appeal is not knowing what is going to happen next. But bloody disgusting podcaster Trace Thurman came out and tried to stop people from talking negatively about the film, because fanaticism means that every perceived attack on the genre must be quickly snuffed out, saying, gentle reminder that the trailer gave away the whole movie isn't a valid critique, even if it is true, hashtag Abigail. <laughs> and this supremely got on my nerves, and I said, I mean, it's definitely a valid criticism if it makes the first hour of the movie feel completely pointless because you know all of the things that's happening on screen revolving the crime family don't actually matter because you know it's actually a vampire. No. To which he said, that only matters for your first viewing. Do you like all movies less on a second viewing because you know what's going to happen? And I just want to ask, what the fuck are you talking about? That basic argument is saying that it only ruins the first time you experience the art, which is probably also the only time you're ever going to watch it. I really don't see a yearly rewatch of Abigail in my future. I only rewatch movies for one of two reasons. Okay. So the first is for work if I need to revisit something for the channel. But in my free time, I only do that if I really like a movie in the first place. And if an advertising campaign is so bad that it ruined the initial watch and put a bad taste in my mouth, why would I ever then go back to experience that again? 20 years ago, when I was a kid, I loved the series of unfortunate event books, and my mom took me to see the movie when it came out, and kids were yelling so loudly in the theater that you couldn't even hear the dialogue, and it ruined the experience for me, and I never watched it again, despite loving the books. And I still today remember what a negative experience it was watching that movie in the theater. You don't develop a fan base and years of dedication to your work of art if your marketing ruins the initial reception to the film. The second watches are defined by the crucial initial experience and impressions the movie made on us. Watching a movie for the first time and watching a movie for the second time are two drastically different experiences, and you are doing those for extremely different reasons. Trace then tried to argue that it isn't fair to judge the film based on its horrible marketing campaign, but it totally is. The film and movie theater do not exist in a vacuum outside of the realities of time and space. I cannot, through sheer force of will, forget that I was bombarded with these ads when I watched the film. The trailers, the poster, the Blu-ray box, and every aspect of the delivery of the art are all singular pieces of the art itself. They are intrinsically connected to each other. Trace then tried to say that I was wrong by sending me a tweet from horror filmmaker Ted Gagan, whose work I do like and I've said that to him, but he said, makes me think of the very first trailer from For Dust Till Dawn back in 96. People said it gave away the second act twist and Rodriguez replied, great, now people will know what you're in store for. To which, I would just have to say that just because someone dropped the ball 30 years ago does not mean that we have to stand on ceremony and continue to drop the ball in perpetuity. We can do better than this. Both Abigail and From Dust Till Dawn absolutely work better as films if the people watching them do not know that they are secretly about vampires. The scripts are clearly intended for that to be a surprise. That is a horrible argument that does not make sense. I genuinely think that any filmmaker who made a mystery film would protest behind closed doors if the advertising people tried to show the reveal of the mystery itself in the trailer. I mean, really, what are we doing here? I used to work in film market research, often on the advertising end. This is objectively a bad advertising campaign that only works in the short term for a small amount of initial money but burns customers once they realize that they have been had. I genuinely believe that you could cut several different types of trailers for this film that don't even hint that it is about vampires that would have still helped to build a loyal fan base. And if you want a good example of this, just go watch the trailers for Malignant and Barbarian. They both had great campaigns. Both are monster films that do not have the monster even hinted at in the trailer and makes the Abigail advertising team look like total amateurs. 
BJ Colangelo came out in defense of the trailer showing the end of the film, saying, If they hit it, Universal has to bank on people showing up for a movie about a little girl being kidnapped and held hostage. There could have been a tease that there's something more to her, but that's a big risk for general audiences who already assume the worst. Like, oh no, won't somebody think of poor Universal, whose music division alone has a market cap of $53 billion, their music subsidiary is literally the largest music company in the world, and it is just a portion of the larger Universal brand. But they had no other option other than to ruin the movie that filmmakers had carefully spent years of their life putting together. They just had to do it. By the way, Abigail ended up making 10 million in its opening weekend. Do you know what else made 10 million in their opening weekends? Barbarian, Thanksgiving, and Talk To Me all made 10 million or so in the first weekend. The first Omen and Renfield did 9, Evil Dead Rise did 24, but that shouldn't really count, and none of these gave away their entire films and instead coasted off vibes, fun energy, and confidence. There is zero evidence that the Abigail trailer and marketing campaign gave them any advantage over similarly sized horror movies. Malignant did not make 10 million on its weekend, but it also came out in 2021 and was still affected by COVID. And even then, it still made 5 million. There is no logical argument to be made in defense of Abigail's marketing team. And so to do so is only out of a blind defense of all things horror. And also, the very next day after our interaction, Trace tweeted about the new film titled The Coffee Table and said, Hands down one of my favorite recent viewing experiences because my jaw was on the floor for most of its runtime. Go in blind. Go in blind. And this happens just about every time that you publicly make very light criticism of a horror movie. When the trailer for the new Strangers movie came out recently, I tweeted that The Strangers was never particularly good in the first place, and that we didn't need to keep getting these things that are essentially just remakes every single time. To which Vicente Francisco Garcia, who we have talked about before here, said, The OG film is a masterpiece. To which I said, I mean, that is using the word masterpiece pretty liberally. Also, why comment on my post? I've literally seen you tweet that you think I'm an idiot before. It's not like I'm going to play nice with you. To which he said, I have literally no idea who you are or any memory of prior interaction with you. But it's funny to me how you have no issue bashing a film but immediately get wounded by someone disagreeing with your public post. We went on like that for a little while and I wasn't wounded. I really try not to take things like that personally, but I'm always curious about the psychology behind why people talk the way that they do. I've never really liked how that guy just talks to most people on a daily basis. Our interaction even ended with him saying, oh my god, you are that guy. Yeah, I was rude about that because I did end up watching your video and hearing your side and completely disagreed with it and thought it was a terrible, horrible, no good take, LMAO, copyright is there for a reason, good day sir. Nothing is allowed to be criticized by these people who subscribe to this kind of mindset. And this fanatical pattern of blind worship needs to be interrupted because a healthy media relationship can only be achieved on a cultural level if we all acknowledge that nothing is beyond basic criticism, no matter how much we may or may not enjoy the work that is being discussed. I could talk for hours about things that I don't like in my favorite movies. That doesn't take away from my base enjoyment of them. It causes reflection and actually reinforces the things I appreciate about them as works of art and lets us learn how we can interact with the art on a deeper level. Going back to that Abigail example for a second, the weekend it hit theaters, the most hated Hollywood Joe Russo said, horror fans, it's important Abigail beats Civil War this weekend. Industry analysts have been sharpening their pencils for weeks, ready to write that horror is out, but we know horror is never out. Don't let them trick execs into taking the gas off horror. Plus, Abigail rips. This is the kind of language that fundamentalist Christians use, and we are subjecting people to listening to it in relation to a moderately decent movie about vampire children eating people. I hate to make this comparison because it is so overdone, but it really is that kind of Orwellian fascist idea that there needs to be a constant enemy to fight to keep morale high among the common people. That every new horror movie is a strange battle to be won that is fought in secret for esoteric reasons. That there is a clear winner and a loser. That all of this is exceptionally more important than it actually is. These people act like there's not been a constant steady stream of new horror movies made almost weekly since the 1950s. Horror is fine. It isn't going anywhere. It will outlast us all, and it is and always has been essentially always profitable. There is no battle to be fought, and there never was, never has been. There will be a new horror movie released this weekend, 
and another next weekend, and another the weekend after that, and the weekend after that, and the weekend after that. I kind of think that some of these examples will be somewhat seen as a dividing line, and is going to be a cultural linchpin within the horror community of who actually is coming at this from an art perspective. And who is just about raw and ending consumption, and defensive companies that are so large they could buy your whole town and sell you for parts. <laughs> if you go back to Trace's Twitter, the only time that he ever mentions the Late Night with the Devil controversy is through mocking it, and making light of the situation, when he said during that ongoing conversation, would love for someone to make a themed calendar of the daily controversies that take place on horror Twitter. Like seriously, what are we angry about today? Although I couldn't help but laugh when days after our small argument he seemingly was still steaming about me and subtweeted me saying, can't decide if I loathe people bitching about trailers or about publicity stills more. Someone else said, please don't be subtweeting me, I come in peace about trailers usually, to which he then responded, wasn't about a specific person, just a general reaction to everyone's thoughts on that Superman still, plus remnant feelings to everyone complaining about these spoilers in the Abigail and Trap trailers. From what I can tell though, I'm actually the only person that he got mad at over Abigail. Then, several days after that, I think he was still mad at me and tweeted again, wonder how the marketing for Carrie would fly in today's spoiler adverse culture. Okay, so keeping with Late Night with the Devil. Tananarive Du said about the film, Late Night with the Devil is immersive and irresistible. It's the kind of horror movie that climbs into the car with you for a ride home and slips under your covers. And David Desmolchin, his performance is the star turn horror fans have been waiting for. Not once does she mention any of the conversation happening around the movie itself, because that would go against the general narrative that horror is thriving, needs protecting, and does no wrong. Just like Cody Leach ignoring the Spacey situation entirely in his review of Mad Monster Con. Within hers, she's totally sidestepping the important conversation about AI being used, which is bigger than the movie itself. She tweeted this the same day that everyone was having this conversation about the film's use of AI imagery. And not mentioning it is a deliberate decision on her part, centrism that is being done in the defense of horror, that is allowing conservative harm to be perpetrated. Mick Garris did this as well, posting essentially the same thoughts without ever actually addressing any of the problems surrounding it as a work of art. But that isn't all that surprising to me because his podcast took NFT sponsorships during the heyday of all that, and even had NFT trading cards featuring pictures of him sitting at the microphone recording the podcast on OpenSea. Something that I think will forever or at least in my mind, taint his otherwise very impressive and interesting legacy. For one last example of this, Mike Flanagan in this time did the exact same thing. When someone asked him his thoughts on the AI issue surrounding the film, and all he said was, my thoughts are that I think that this is an excellent movie. He deliberately ignored what their question was asking, but still responded to them so that they understood that he was deliberately ignoring them. At the end of every single year, there's an article published through some major outlet that collects the list of the so-called worst movies of the year. These are always extremely popular and get their intended goal of making people publicly performatively angry and talking about them. At the beginning of 2023, it was Variety with their list of worst films of 2022 that included great films like Bones and All and 3,000 Years of Longing, who had the honor of having that one that was quote tweeted roughly 1,500 times, having comments from the likes of Elijah Wood and Dan Slott. All in all, a pretty successful endeavor for something that probably took 30 minutes of real actual work. That they will, you know, almost certainly repeat every single year to the same results. We all know that worst of lists are almost in every single circumstance critical malpractice. They're trashy, attention seeking, purposefully contrarian, and clickbait incarnate. It is something that should be avoided in most instances, at all costs, and should not be given the attention or time of day. If nobody gave them any interaction, they just simply wouldn't exist. They're all made because they're popular, and most people would rather have their internet points dunking on those articles than actually having them, you know, not exist. But I personally don't believe that these things are necessarily wrong 100% of the time. The logic should not apply to art that is actively co-signing harm. And so we're going to do a little bit of that here this time. Everybody who's watched me for a while knows that I love Stephen King and respect him deeply, but there's something that we do disagree on. In his article, Why We Crave Horror, he famously said, we go to reestablish our feelings of essential normality. The horror movie is innately conservative, even reactionary. And I flat out think this is wrong. It is a quote that often gets taken out of context and used in bad faith, as you could imagine. If you read the entire piece, he is essentially arguing that horror is often used to set and reinforce the standard of what is seen as normal versus abnormal. 
we have the idealization of suburban white homes, and we have the representation of evil that is attacking it. That is essentially something that is based in tropes, and in that, based in stereotypes. Which is an argument that can definitely be made, especially at the time of writing that, during the height of Reaganism and teenagers getting killed over and over again in slasher films. On a base level, you can see what he's trying to get to, and it isn't as radical of a take as it may seem on the surface, but I still mostly disagree. I do find it funny that around Halloween, conservative outlets will publish articles talking about horror movies that conservatives can enjoy without conflicting with their views. And I love reading those articles, because it takes a particular kind of skill to bend something so wrongly that by the end of the conversation it feels like we're talking about something completely different. I love art. And I particularly love how many different people can watch the same thing and come away with conflicting feelings and inspiration and ideas about certain works. That's what, you know, makes all of this fun. But these are clearly so far off the mark they aren't even in the same ballpark or playing the same sport as the rest of us. In their 2014 article titled, The Eight Most Conservative Horror Films of All Time, The Federalist actually tried to argue that Night of the Living Dead is one of the best conservative horror movies ever made. You know, one of the first mainstream movies to have a black male protagonist that ends with a definitive statement about how black people are treated by lynch mobs at the time. Actually, argue isn't the right word choice there, because if you actually read what they said, no argument is made as to why it is conservative. They just say that it's a good movie, and that's because they don't actually have any values, and they don't really believe in anything. These articles in general are pretty unhinged and give you a perspective on the genre that you never see in other spaces because they're wrong. But it also shows that these people have to force pre-existing art to fit into their ideologies, because there's so little good art that reinforces their abhorrent beliefs. Breitbart did an article called Five Great Horror Movies That Warned Us About the Woke Gestapo that includes They Live, which John Carpenter himself has said is a movie about Ronald Reagan. On another list, they talk about how good Jeepers Creepers was, because of course they do. They also praise Frailty for being a pro-Christian movie about a man who's on a serious mission from God, which if you have seen Frailty, that is a very funny thing to say about that movie. But there's always been this thing that I've encountered more and more in recent years that is becoming more of a growing problem among modern horror releases that I finally decided I wanted to publicly talk about it, which is this kind of anti-horror horror movie where you sit down to watch a film and you get tricked into watching basically a conservative propaganda think piece that is cloaked in the cinematic language of a traditional horror film, but one that does not align with the values of outsider horror art that you would expect going into it. Anybody who takes the form of horror cinema and then contorts it in a way to trick the audience into being exposed to a conservative theme that they believe in and want to share in their art is being purposefully disingenuous to the very reasons that language exists in the first place and was created. These tools were not made to be used in a way that argues that the very people who created them don't deserve life, freedoms, and dignity. And this has been done many times before, and sometimes has been done quite successfully. Most famously, I would argue that The Exorcist has a very conservative bent to it. It is literally a tale of the American youth being corrupted, and then only saved by the establishments that we are told are here to protect us both physically and spiritually. That doesn't stop it from being an incredibly well-made work of art, though. It just needs to be viewed, appreciated, and critiqued within the political and cultural space that it was made and exists in. And you can basically say the same thing about any good horror film that has a major cop protagonist character. Near Dark is another example of an amazing work of horror that is, at its core, deeply fascist. A movie can be exceptionally fun, bombastic, and very well made, and still have that be true. In fact, spectacle is a huge aspect of fascist art. It tells the story of Caleb, the very picture of the idealization of the American youth. He is the son of a farmer, and the family live off of the land, until one day Caleb decides that this life is too small for him, and he runs away with a group of nomadic queer punks who end up being vampires, who turn him into one of them and initiate him into their way of life that is hidden away in the shadows. He is only cured of his vampirism, which is merely a stand-in for sexual proclivities, when the lifeblood of the symbol of the American conservative traditionalist message is injected directly into his veins, where he then wakes up from this haze of a cloud that he's been trapped within to realize how wrong he has been, and then he and the farmer team up to go hunt down and kill all the queers, I mean vampires. There are plenty of liberal figures within the pantheon of horror that help to prop up conservative values or are just outright causing harm that still produce quality work. Again, I love Stephen King. I will always be thankful for him to help me on the path to loving books, but at the same time, 
You know, he sits at home every day for weeks tweeting about Trump and trial. But then the day after the police siege on Columbia, he was totally radio silence. Earlier this year, he tweeted, I'm not worried about AI because I got my mojo working, which is the epitome of the Republican fuck you got mine attitude. A billionaire telling you that there's nothing to worry about because he is personally going to be fine. Francis Ford Coppola made one of the best horror films of all time with Bram Stoker's Dracula, but also was the financial backer of Victor Salva's Clown House in 1989 where the star of the film, Nathan Forrest Winters, was raped by the director. Coppola would later say, I didn't know of anything improper going on, although I witnessed some things that caused me to raise an eyebrow. Only in retrospect did things really add up. You have to remember, while this was a tragedy, that the difference in age between Victor and the boy was very small. Victor was practically a child himself. Victor Salva was at the time 29. Nathan Forrest Winters was 12. According to the Los Angeles Times, just before Salva went to prison, he spoke to Coppola, who told him that the experience would have value. Francis said it will make you a better artist, Salva recalls. He left out one important part, if you survive it. After prison, Coppola gave Salva a loan to help him get reestablished, and I've read multiple times that he has been alleged to have personally sued Nathan Forrest Winters the 12 year old who was raped under his watch as a producer for breaching his contract and publicly talking about the incident which harmed the box office returns of Clown House. After prison, Disney would famously hire Salva to direct Powder for them in 1995 and the Tampa Bay Times reported. A company insider said Disney was concerned because a beautiful movie was being overshadowed by the controversy, adding, we don't do witch hunts, we're not the CIA, and we don't do security clearance on people. People here are judged by their talents, we're not judging their personal lives. There are lawyers and courts that do that. Salva was allowed to make seven more films after this, most of them horror because of the industry support provided by Coppola. And then, you know, there's the whole recent story of his behavior on the set of Megalopolis. But the thing is that either despite their conservative leanings or connections to prominent figures who have caused harm, some of these movies can range from being pretty good to great iconic films. If we look at it in a vacuum, I do have to admit that at least the first act of Jeepers Creepers is technically well made. I think it is fair to say that The Exorcist is objectively a culturally revered film that is also quite good. It stands for an artistic merit in cinema beyond just what it baseline is saying, but the same cannot be said about the later exorcism subgenre that would spawn from this movie's success, that all to some extent have that lingering conservative leaning established and canonized in The Exorcist, with the worst that I've ever seen being the recent Pray for the Devil. Everything about this film is awful. I think it is my least favorite horror movie that I have ever paid to watch. It tells the story of a nun named Sister Anne, who is given the rare blessing by the church to assist in exorcisms, and uses the vague visual language of feminism to actually tell a story that is strongly anti-women's rights, as it uses the monster and metaphor of the devil as a means to preach an anti-abortion story. As the demons are able to enter these women, who either had abortions or gave up their children for adoption, by literally moving into their stomachs and making them appear as if they are pregnant, using their sin of abandonment and killing their unborn children as a catalyst to infect them with evil, the devil in this film is only really interested in women, who made these decisions for themselves. And this movie is very goofy. From one of the male priests in the few shots having a clearly visible neck tattoo, down to the girl boss kind of ending, where she doesn't have to wear her nun's habit anymore and gets to wear robes like the men. Everything about what it is doing on a narrative level is extremely conservative coded, and that was a deliberate choice. You don't have to do that. One could look at this year's The First Omen, or Immaculate, to find examples of demon possession movies about nuns and about pregnancy that are both extremely progressive in what they are doing. The setting of being in a church does not necessarily dictate conservatism, and is something that should be dropped from future exorcism movies. The Dead Don't Die is an example of the kind of film that can become conservative by being misguided in how badly it is handling its writing. I actually do like this film a lot more than the average person, I think, as you ever really only hear negative things about it. It is a folksy kind of horror movie set in a small sleepy town that gets attacked by zombies. I actually do think that the film suffers because of the zombie stuff, because it is much better before they are actually introduced. Before we start though, it should be said that Jim Jeremush is obviously not a conservative in any way. To prove this for the sake of the video, I'll include this here where he said in 2019, The lesser of two evils does not appeal to me, and I don't like the two-party system anyway. I don't know why people aren't all over the electoral college in this nonsense. Well, I do know why. 
because it's the corporate media. What disturbs me now is that my friends who don't like Trump spend more time talking on Trump than the people who like Trump. Trump sets the content for the corporate media every day. And by corporate media, I mean MSNBC and CNN and Fox. They're all the same. It's just the Trump channels. I like some things about Elizabeth Warren. I, of course, like Bernie Sanders. I like what's his name? The governor of Washington state, who's the only really environmentally conscious one, Jay Inslee. And of course, I like AOC. She's too young. But I'm trying to stay away from it right now because the Joe Biden thing makes me deeply depressed. But with the dead don't die, what he is trying to say is kind of so vapid that it ends up playing into conservative talking points. He's doing Romero zombies here through and through, but much more clunky than Romero ever did. When the dead come back to life, the first thing a lot of them do is start playing on their cell phones and mumbling about the shitty Wi-Fi. It almost comes across as if your grandmother's Facebook posts were adapted into a horror film. Steve Buscemi's character, Farmer Frank, is a horrible racist who wears an altered MAGA hat to make sure that everybody knows that when he says make America great again, he's specifically talking about white people. And this is included in the film, but is never actually dealt with in any meaningful specific way before he realizes that zombies are attacking his property. He impulsively shoots a black one in the head on his porch, without warning. But then he ends up dying the next scene, and the film has no interest in actually dealing with this outside of the basic presentation of who this person is. And it ends with a scene where Tom Waits' character, Hobo Bob, who is a hermit who lives away from society because he dislikes us, and he's narrating about the empty-headed consumerist culture of America, while our main cop characters, who are the only survivors left in the town, are callously shooting people in the head that they've known for decades. And in a way, it is maybe trying to say something negative about the police, but to me, I think that is kind of a generous reading. And my experience with it was that it was a sad and depressing film where we're watching a 70-year-old artist kind of flounder while attempting to and failing to write anything helpful about the current political climate, while at the same time kind of misunderstanding how zombie stories traditionally function. They Slash Them is a movie that I am fully convinced was only made because it had a clever name, because everything about this to me is awful, and is another example of a film that might have had good intentions, but is so weak in its delivery that it wraps back around into being a conservative horror film in my eyes. Like, even the name itself is almost making fun of people who put an emphasis on pronouns. It might not be deliberate trying to, but it certainly skirts that line. It is a slasher film that takes place at a conversion camp and basically does everything that you would expect with that concept. As a queer person, I don't really need the reclamation of gay conversion camps in films and works of horror. It has been a strange recent trend to me. There's been a lot of dramatized conversion camp works in the past decade. I don't really think that we need to depict people going through that and then standing up to their own oppressors in that kind of direct way. It worked once in But I'm a Cheerleader, but only by the skin of its camp 90s teeth. It is to me too on the nose as a setting for horror writing. You can build a horror monster that represents hate against gay people that isn't literally depicting the horrible things that have happened to us for decades. To demonstrate my point, I'm talking about metaphors here. If we look at another similar group, I think what Jordan Peele did in Get Out by building metaphor that stands in for different kinds of actions done by white people to and around black people is far more interesting in its ability to analyze small social actions than if he had just made an outright movie about the Klan or neo-Nazis that was much more direct and heavy-handed in its messaging. The metaphor that he creates builds a distance from the real-life events to where we can talk about these things in a way that just works better most of the time, both in an abstract academic sense but also as entertainment within horror itself. I think if we tried to think about these concepts more abstractly, we could come up with better material than just evil conversion camp man. Even from its base core concept, this is a huge mistake that ends up being the kind of movie that straight people would kind of expect gay people to make and enjoy. It more or less places us in their box and ends up playing in territories of their language instead of our own, if that makes sense. I think a movie like Evil Dead Rise having casual trans mask representation that doesn't even acknowledge it and just treats it as normal and even goes so far as to allowing that character to be kind of a bit of an idiot instead of handling them with kid gloves does so much more good than the simplicity of a movie that has the obvious message that conversion camps are really bad and shouldn't exist. This one is not a huge offender, obviously, but has somewhat bothered me since it came out specifically because it was made by Blumhouse which we will get into here in a bit. It is another example of Jason Blum profiting off of minorities while working against their values simultaneously. And overall, it just feels like the kind of useless statement that a politician would put out that says something that everyone already knows and agrees with and does absolutely nothing in any radical way like a horror film dealing with these issues should. 
You also have horror movies that argue that the very act of making horror is a bad thing and should not be done because of its real harm in the outside world, which can be done in films that otherwise are good such as Scream, or can be done very badly in bad movies like Random Acts of Violence, a 2019 film by Jay Baruchel about a comic book artist named Todd. He has created the number one selling comic book in America called Slasher Man which honestly should really tell you about how badly this is gonna go if they're trying to pass off that a book called Slasher Man is going to not only sell well, but also outsell the biggest titles from Marvel and DC. Which, you know, it's ultimately a small thing, but I hate when a film has so little respect for an art form that it is trying to depict that it doesn't even do basic research on how this fictional work of art would fit within the actual landscape of our world and the industry that they're talking about. Jay Baruchel got relentlessly made fun of online when this came out because while doing press for it, he was insinuating that this was going to be his big turn into directing full time and that most horror movies are bad and that he was here to make one of the really great ones. And then the film comes out and it's just about how horror is awful and anyone who likes it is a degenerate. And now he's hardly worked since then. Basically the film is about how an obsessive fan begins to kill everyone in Todd's life who is important to him in ways that characters are brutally killed in Todd's comics basically arguing that these horrible things that came out of his mind have come back to haunt him and that the horror community is filled with mentally ill freaks. Todd hates interacting with all of his fans because it disturbs him how much they are into the gross things that he creates. And you know, in general, it is a very dumb business idea to make and then try and sell a movie to a group of people that you are arguing are mentally unwell individuals who are not properly socially adjusted. That seems like a bad move to me. And you know, Sometimes this happens where a certain movie is done so poorly that we just have to laugh at it. Never Feed the Troll from 2010 is easily one of the most inept horror works ever made and is also one of the best experiences I've ever had in the theater. And it's a shame that it is basically unwatchable lost media now. It is up there with Birdemic for its confidence and how awful it is and how often it stumbles in trying to deliver its message, which is also bad. I saw this at a film festival and had literal tears rolling down my face. Everyone in the audience had an amazing time. Genuinely, one of the best theatrical experiences of my life. It is a horror film about a preacher's wife being stalked in very funny ways online because someone learns that she once cheated on the preacher and is going to be killed because of her infidelity. The IMDB reviews from the time, obviously written by themselves and their friends and family, declare it to be a return to Hitchcock suspense and thriller. If you manage to track this down, please, please preserve it somehow because I really don't know if it even exists anymore. The footage that you're seeing is from the trailer that is still online. It is a classic of bad taste waiting to be discovered. I haven't seen this movie in almost 15 years, but I distinctly remember that there's a really good bit where the hacker powers her computer back on even though she unplugged it from the wall, at which point the entire audience howled with laughter. Why are you doing this? I will do something about it. Dashcam in 2021 was probably the most mask off modern conservative horror film to receive a release this wide. Coming off their success in 2020 with Host, filmmakers Rob Savage and Jed Shepard partnered with a larger company to do a theatrical spiritual successor to their low budget streaming feature about a found footage COVID lockdown ghost story. The film stars conservative media personality and conspiracy theorist Annie Hardy as herself as she flees to Europe to escape the draconian United States and their insane restrictions to the COVID pandemic, only to be dismayed when she finds that England is in a very similar situation as America and how they are handling the pandemic. The film took advantage of public spaces being mostly empty and was shot in a very guerrilla style method on real locations in 2020. When forced to wear a mask indoors, she writes slave over it in protest. As the film's story unfolds, we see Annie show off her favorite hat, mocks people by jokingly calling them essential workers in sarcastic ways, refuses to wear a mask in almost every situation, and gets into a confrontation with a restaurant worker when he asks her to put one on. She goes into a fit and starts breaking things that they own while yelling QAnon bullshit. The film presents him as being the unreasonable one in the situation. The comment section that is on screen at all times constantly uses slurs, including the word faggot multiple times. From what I can tell, neither Shepard nor Savage are actually queer, but I can't find conclusive evidence to say that 100%. But if they aren't, they really shouldn't feel comfortable casually using that word within their works. 
the hosts that she is staying with say they don't like the way that she is acting and she calls them libtards and leaves. To the camera afterwards, she makes several negative racial remarks about her own friends. A stranger asks Annie to use her car to drive a very sick older woman to get medical help. Annie refuses to do this and calls the woman a human trafficker. She only accepts when she takes advantage of the situation and charges the woman a lot of money to drive. She casually mentions that the elite are using children to harvest adrenochrome. And believe it or not, this is all in the first 15 minutes or so of the movie, before the horror even actually starts. It is an exhausting experience. For a popcorn horror movie, Hardy's void of a personality really does take any possible enjoyment that could have been found here. I never really use this kind of language, but in her case, it is warranted. Annie Hardy is a legitimately stupid person, and giving her a movie or platform to showcase her views from is dangerous. There's just no other way to put it. She is genuinely stupid hiding behind an aesthetic and should not be given a platform this large. At one point when talking about Trump with Medium, she said, When everybody hates someone this much, I automatically like them. Because people are idiots. Plus, people all kind of hate me for no reason. I think I'm good. I try to embody the teachings of Jesus. People hate Jesus, though, and they hate me, and they hate Trump. Oh great, now I look like I'm comparing myself to Trump and Jesus. But I mean, I'm not and I am. I just want everyone to be happy, even though they don't want to be. The major problem with Dashcam as a work of art is that it presents Hardy as a person with no criticism at all, similarly to Farmer Frank in The Dead Don't Die. The eventual problems that face her have nothing to do with her being forced to confront her dangerous ideology. The sick old woman ends up being a monster for largely unexplained reasons, besides some slight insinuations that the workings of a cult are at play, and Hardy and her friend have to kill it and escape. But at no point are these events actually tied thematically at all to the inclusion of her own personal hateful beliefs. There are times where they are seemingly presenting her views as foolish, or that we should think all of this is funny but there's no effort placed in the filmmaking or writing to demonstrate that this is supposed to be a work that is lampooning Hardy as a person, rather than reinforcing her beliefs. You know, as the old adage goes, satire requires a clarity of purpose and target, lest it be mistaken for and contribute to that which it is intending to criticize. If you have a movie that is depicting a fascist, starring a real-life fascist who is basically playing herself, who is making a lot of money from this project, with no clear substantial criticism of her views within the film, then, by that logic, have you not just made a fascist movie that both reaffirms her views, as well as having given her a megaphone to say them from? For some reason, People really loved Host, but this movie was a total failure in all regards. Funny that. I think that with the rise of social media, we have had the unintended effect within the genre of people who report on horror and write about horror, becoming closer on a personal level with the people who make horror media, and often take sponsorships and advertisements and free screeners and gifts to talk positively about the things that people they know personally have made. Some might call these things bribes, <laughs> and I think that is a very gray area where my personal position on the matter is that as a reviewer and critic and journalist, it is unethical to review the work or report on the doings of people that you have become familiar with on a social level. Now, this has always been the case to some degree. Film interviewees and journalists have always had a certain rapport with people in the film industry. Things wouldn't get done if that were not true. But rarely before the past decade has the line between professional respect and personal friendship been so blurred to this degree within entertainment publishing. And it is even worse within horror because the community is so small. It is a fraction of a fraction of the pop media landscape. And in a world where your own average film journalist or critic can become an online micro-celebrity in their own right, you have this dynamic where the media becomes a shield to those with power and money who may do things that are ethically questionable. Or even if they don't do anything necessarily wrong and they just put out a lackluster film. I'm not trying to be a dick here. I hate giving anything a bad review, genuinely. I always go into art to try and meet it on its level, but just as an example of what I'm trying to talk about here, everyone in these spaces online tried to gas up It's a Wonderful Knife last year. It was even the cover story for Fangoria, and that thing was mid at best, barely passable, and only saved by Justin Long giving a total weirdo performance. But if you listened to the buzz online around it like I did, then you would have thought that you were about to sit down for an instant classic, only for you to sit there and worry that you must be the one with awful taste. But the writer, Michael Kennedy, is well liked within the community and used to be popular on Twitter before he left. And at least from my perspective, I just got to wonder that if this film existed within a vacuum of its own, would the response have been what it was? 
and this happens near monthly, there are probably at least two dozen other examples I could have picked to talk about this concept with. I like and respect Mick Garris a lot, but back in 2018, people would look you in the eye and tell you that this movie with this effect that is intended to represent a message given from the afterlife was well done. It is a pattern of regular online behavior, and to find the actual good stuff, you've got to kind of train your ears to fine tune out all the bullshit that people say in the review space. I really do love places like Fangoria. I need that to be clear. I have a stack of them next to my work desk, but also, it does have to be acknowledged that their primary goal before anything else is to sell you new horror films whether they are good or not, and are legitimately comfortable lying to you about the quality of a film for money. Places like that should be seen as advertisements first and foremost, and not as legitimate critical pieces most of the time. And I don't think that should even be a huge controversial statement to say. They spent one of their four yearly issues last year telling you how good Exorcist Believer was going to be. I purposefully have never made close friends with people who actually make movies or with many people in the critical horror space to be honest, because in a lot of ways that would compromise an integral part of my job. If I knew Mick Garris on a personal level, I would have probably not been shameless enough to say that about his movie just now. I think to be a critic, you have to purposefully distance yourself from the thing that you are criticizing, and to not do so in some circumstances is questionable. There must be a clear delineation between you as the critic and the subject of the criticism. Remember just a little bit ago when I was talking about Tanana Reeve Du completely sidestepping the controversy of Late Night with the Devil in her short tweet review? Well, what I neglected to mention about that, which ties into this, is that about an hour later she also posted a picture of her on a couch with David Desmalchen at an event for the film that was funded by Shudder who distributed the project. And when I see that, how am I supposed to believe anything that she ever has to say as a cultural critic? If she is not engaging in good faith with the active conversation happening around a work of art, while also showing that she is close or at least friendly with the people who made that art. If she had acknowledged why people were upset with it, but said that she still liked the movie despite that, then that would have at least been somewhat respectable. I've done that tons of times. And I always try to acknowledge why an enjoyable work of art is also at the same time a harmful one, if I'm aware of the things that people are taking issue with. But she doesn't do that. She pretends it simply isn't happening. And taking a centrist, money-based position compromises her current and future credibility, at least to me. And it is okay to be friends with people who make art. I'm not saying that. It isn't a crime that she knows David Desmalchen. But I do think it is ethically wrong to engage yourself in an ongoing public conversation as a public figure if your own public position has been compromised by your personal connections. And every time this happens, I feel like I'm going a little bit crazy. Especially because nobody ever really talks about this groupthink social media journalist and creator relationship psychology phenomenon at all. But everybody's gotta kinda think about it sometimes, right? Like, Brandon Struznik is the only person I've ever heard talk about this in at least a roundabout kind of way when he tweeted about the controversy surrounding Late Night with the Devil. I feel like I'm losing my mind seeing the level of this poor little movie towards a film currently in wide release with distribution on a pretty sizable streamer in a month because people are saying it sucks that it used AI. Just say you dug the movie, lol. I love and respect all of you, so I'm really not trying to be a dick. I just don't understand being mad at folks not wanting to support it. Casting crew or paid. It's out there for the rest of the not terminally online to see. I think it's going to be okay. I feel like we give special exemptions for shit we like made by people we like, and I'm not sure I'm into that. Again, I'm not subtweeting any one person. I'm just saying I, Brandon James Struznik, disagree with the approach but I'm sure we'll agree on lots of other stuff. As you probably well know, Spyglass Entertainment refused to pay Neve Campbell what she felt like she deserved to return for Scream 6, and as a result, she walked from that project and did not appear in that film. In her statement, she would publicly say, As a woman, I have had to work extremely hard in my career to establish my value, especially when it comes to Scream. I felt the offer that was presented to me did not equate the value I have brought to the franchise. It's been a very difficult decision to move on. To all of my Scream fans, I love you. You've always been so incredibly supportive to me. I'm forever grateful to you and what this franchise has given me over the past 25 years. The new star of the series, Melissa Barrera, put out a statement at the time that said, We are all heartbroken, but we totally understand and respect her decision and hopefully if we get to make another one, we can have her back. 
Cut to Scream 7 and Spyglass fired basically their entire cast and crew because Barrera posted something on social media in support of Palestine. Which is something that gained a lot of media attention as you probably well know. Neve Campbell did not pay Barrera the same professional respect and said nothing publicly in support of her as far as I can tell. Then. On March 12th, Neve Campbell announced that she was coming back to Scream 7, taking Barrera's job as the lead in that film. I hope that we can all at least agree that this is an objectively wrong thing for her to have done, both to her own legacy as well as to her peers, and that she would have just been better off to let the Scream door shut behind her and move on to new things while still being loved and remembered fondly, and that we also should not financially reward Spyglass by going to see their new Scream film, where they will absolutely be weaponizing nostalgia and goodwill against you to profit off of this. So in the weeks following, Brera has since unfollowed Neve Campbell on social media, and it is clear who is deeply in the wrong in this situation. And I want to look at one tweet in particular here that got a lot of attention from the day of this announcement. They came from John Squires, the editor-in-chief for Bloody Disgusting. And I want it to be painfully clear, I am not mad at him necessarily. I don't like what he said here, I think it's wrong. But everything that we're talking about today is done with the purpose of being constructive and looking at how we discuss these kinds of things. I want us all to do better and to be better as a community, and that is why I'm taking the time to say all of this. Do not go harassing him on my behalf over this. If there's one thing that I want to take away from this video, it is that I do not want to publicly destroy someone with nuclear hellfire anymore just for a single thing that they said that we didn't like, if they have a history of at least trying to have good intentions. One perceived misstep, as long as it is not, you know, hyper egregious should not lead to the destruction of someone's professional life. We should be engaging with everything a person has said over their entire career and treating them with empathy. And John is one of the most positive constant forces within horror. And I think ultimately he meant well here. I've not said this before, but John is actually arguably the person who gave me my start here with this channel. And he doesn't even really know that probably. Okay, so my second video that I ever made was that one on Goosebumps and 90s horror media for kids, if you remember. And John actually ran an article about the video on Bloody Disgusting, which got the attention of R.L. Stein, who then soon after tweeted about the video saying that he liked it, which led to me getting my first huge boost in subscribers that started my journey that led me to where I am right now. Trust me when I say that it is not normal for your second YouTube video that you ever make to get picked up by the algorithm, or covered in a news site or tweeted about by the person that is the focus of that video. And the fact that it did, I think, can largely be attributed to John writing his article in support of me. And so, <laughs> I, I feel kind of guilty about his inclusion here. And I really don't want this to be read as an attack, and more so just as basic criticism, like I've said for everyone else in this video. Things that I would say about anybody, no matter who it was. And I include it here, because this one tweet I think is emblematic of a lot of issues around entertainment and horror at the moment that we're talking about. He said, Just to get ahead of this overly simplified discourse, no, Neve Campbell isn't a bad person because she's taking a deserved paycheck that she spent her whole career earning. Life is complex. Ten things can be true at once. If you're upset at Spyglass, take it out on Spyglass. But the problem in this is that the situation actually is quite simple. On one side of the issue, you have people openly supporting a colonialist genocide who are making a movie and a popular horror franchise who also just got done making a film with Eli Roth, who is a Zionist and an all-around garbage human being. And on the other side, you have people who think this is a problem. Sometimes, life is actually quite black and white. Any underlying shades of grey get overshadowed when it comes to things as extreme as what is happening in Palestine. When that many deaths have happened, nuance isn't really allowed. It's one of the few times in life where you do definitively have to pick one side or the other. And in this instance, Neve Campbell chose money tainted by the death of children. I think that any actor who willingly took a paycheck in the 1940s to star in a film that was funded by the Nazis should similarly be branded as a bad person by history, who helped to propagate their values. Neve Campbell is a 50-year-old woman. She makes her own decisions and doesn't need to be shielded from the bad ones that she makes by journalists. She is fair game for her actions to be talked about, even if she did play Sidney Prescott. Her decision does make her a bad person, and more than that, a coward. And this stance in this instance that Squires is taking is a fundamentally liberal centrist one, where consumption of product and the generation of money stands in front of any actual held values. And time and time again, we see that when this is done, centrism has to stand with the conservatives on practically every single issue. And when that happens, 
the real effects of harm are ignored and the people perpetrating that harm are given the opportunity to actively expand their harm. They take more power and money and are seen with more public legitimacy. If you notice, money is at the root of all of these problems. And the reason that they are able to continue is by people saying that there's no harm in taking that money, no matter where the source of it may be coming from. Because they themselves are not actively holding the gun with their own hand. Neve Campbell is not directly shooting anyone, but is making it painfully clear that she has no issue working with the people who are helping to hold the gun, and has no respect for any of her peers who were stomped down into the mud for having issues with the gun's presence. And the fact that a lot of horror personalities still embrace Scream 7 after everything that has happened is a clear demonstration of this mental phenomenon of genre fanaticism and money getting in the way of anything that they value in life. Such as horror YouTuber Zach Cherry, who posted about how he got to meet the cast of the upcoming Scream 7, and how he was excited to make content about that. And Creepy Duck Design, who largely became famous for their Scream fan posters that they made that were so good that they just became actual official posters. Which is pretty cool. But they have continued to make posters for Scream 7 to build their online brand, ignoring everything about the ongoing issue. I actually have a lot of respect in this regard to Dead Meat, who are physically in Scream 5 playing themselves, but have come out against the franchise because everything that has gone down. It is not hard to do, and I love that they were among the ones who did the right thing here, even though they have personal and professional ties to the franchise like Creepy Duck Design, who made the wrong decision. In connection to this, probably one of my most radical opinions is that the horror community has become way too reliant and cozy with the presence of the funding of Jason Blum's projects, who is probably the single person that I dislike the most within the gravity of horror film culture, when nearly every horror podcast and outlet over the past six or seven years has been sponsored by whatever upcoming Blumhouse movies that are being released. I think that puts us all in a weird situation where this guy is at the center of everything that we do financially. Because he has to me shown through his actions that he actively holds values against what we should be standing for. I'm not trying to call anyone out in particular at all because at this point it is a very widespread problem. As a community at large, we are way too financially hooked to this guy at a level that frequently makes me very uncomfortable. I immediately question anyone's ethics and legitimacy when I hear them do an ad read for a Blumhouse product. I genuinely can't say for sure because I get a lot of emails like this and honestly I don't read most of them but I am 99% sure that I have been offered money by them at several points in the past for an ad read for upcoming films and essentially everyone who works in horror has as well or gifts or what have you and a great deal of them have accepted that offer. I, as a blanket rule, have never accepted gifts or a sponsorship for my work, even though I get a constant stream of email offers about them. And if I ever do end up doing one, then I hope you will take that as a sign that I genuinely endorse that company and that product. For the record, I have also never accepted a gift in any form from any company that makes horror media. I think that kind of transparency is important there, and I would always disclose if I accepted something. The most that I have ever accepted is from individual authors working independently who have offered to send me free copies of their books because they like my work. But if I ever thought that taking that would put me in a compromising situation that might stand in the way of my own honesty, I would always say no in every single situation. The only thing I have of value left to me in this world is my writing and my perspective. And I would never do a single thing that compromised that, even if that meant I occasionally had to do something that was not the most socially nice thing to do. If the worst thing that you can come at me with is that I'm not always overwhelmingly nice in every single situation, then I can live with that. Because there is a difference between kind and nice, and I'd like to think that I deliver on kind where it counts. Most of us who work here for a living have either had contact with Blum or his company, and almost every one of those interactions have been financially motivated. It just all too often to me feels like we have collectively agreed to this deal with the devil, and everyone is kind of afraid to even talk about it or acknowledge that it's a thing, because to a degree, everyone's hands are kind of dirty from being in the pot. Again. I'm not trying to make accusations against anyone on a personal level. I understand why someone would feel like they needed to take a sponsorship from them. But I hope that after saying this, everyone who is in this position from now on will consider if that money is actually worth it. Because as it stands now, everyone from horror TikTokers and freelance writers on up to the largest horror publications like Fangoria and Bloody Disgusting pose to make a lot of money every single time Blumhouse puts out a large movie. And I'm just here to ask in the politest way that I can for everyone to consider if that is the most ethical thing that we could be doing in this moment. And I hope to stand as an example to show that a horror content business can be run without platforming things like that. 
I've operated for years at this point basically without reviewing a single Blumhouse movie, and that has been intentional. If I ever do platform something from them or something else that I similarly view as a bit dubious, I always address that before I even start talking about why I want to talk about the work itself. As critics, as journalists, as fans, I think we owe it to each other as a community to be forthright with these things, because ultimately, it is within our power what companies we decide to give our voice to. I view Fangoria as being kind of the cultural steward of horror, and they've kind of held that position for decades now. And with that does come a certain level of responsibility in relation to what they decide to publish, because their voice matters. And in my opinion, sometimes they have not been the best about that when it comes to Blum and his movies. I think they often will do great work. And if they hate me after this for saying all of this, that would actually make me tremendously, deeply sad. Because all of this comes from a place of love and professional respect for their position within genre history. And I want that all to be said up front. But for the emphasis that they place on gathering people from different backgrounds to show their own perspectives, from all the great queer writers that they have, the non-white writers, the women writers, the industry legends, just the general professionalism that they typically will show in producing a horror magazine that is managing to thrive in 2024, I just think it's a shame how much their brand relies on Blum's money. Because since the rebranding, out of 22 issues that they have produced by my count, eight of them feature a Blumhouse movie somewhere on the cover, with four of them being the full-blown cover story. And each time that they get a cover story, usually that means there will be multiple articles on the interior dedicated to that Blumhouse movie. And, you know, we all know that 9 times out of 10, these movies are either going to be garbage or just barely passable. The Blumhouse system of rushing things out the door made for 20 bucks does not produce great work most of the time. To the point where they have really started to lose their cultural footing by falling into total self-parody. Like Night Swim, about the haunted swimming pool that features a Major League Baseball playing protagonist who is suffering from Lou Gehrig's disease. Out of their movies that have been on the cover of Fangoria, I would argue that Halloween 2018 and Megan are the only ones that are just okay, with the other ones being genuinely outright bad. And as an organization, they should not be stooping to sell their audience on total garbage movies that they know full and well are absolute pieces of shit. We don't need to be giving Blumhouse and their lazy anti-art system this much publicity and attention when there are so many other better and more interesting things made that don't get the mainline spotlight that they deserve. And to their credit, Fangoria does work hard to spotlight smaller films in every single issue. They are among the best at getting people excited for little movies, and I think they should stretch that talent more to really embrace and lift up the smaller side of horror, which has always been our most interesting work and the backbone of what we all do. To me, I see Blumhouse at their absolute best as the MCU equivalent of horror movies, and I do not mean that as a compliment. I think they are bad for horror. I think they are a bad company that makes mediocre, uninspired, ugly art nine times out of ten. And when they accidentally let a good one through the cracks, it almost certainly is not because they were helping the filmmaker in that process. They famously use market research a ton in deciding the final cuts of their films. And as I've said before, as someone who used to work in film market research before becoming a YouTuber, that process only hurts the work and has, in my opinion, basically never once made a single movie better. They might as well just be hiring a team of carnival psychics to tell them what to do. And I also don't think that just because they are one of the largest public entities of championing horror, that they shouldn't be criticized. In fact, the opposite is true. Their motives absolutely should be evaluated on what they are doing and also what they bring to the table. The business of making movies is a business. Profit is always the goal. Movies are made to make a profit, obviously. Movies are art, but all art and how we have structured our society, for better or for worse, has to be sustainable. Everybody has to eat, and they need a roof over their heads. But there is a difference between being successful to the point of sustainability and being a Silicon Valley style tycoon who doesn't even really seem to care all that much about movies other than the capital they can generate. I absolutely hate that one of the largest public faces of horror for the past decade or so looks like if you type CEO into an AI image generator. And on that note, one of his newest movies, Imaginary, is actually being accused by some of feeling as if it had been written or at least influenced by an AI. Which is what the magic of market research will buy you, by the way. It is an industry of people who are severely depressed that are slowly going insane. I had to watch the trailer for the 2016 children's film Monster Trucks. I would ballpark somewhere in between 400 and 500 times. It is hard to describe what that mentally does to a person when you do that all day long for weeks upon weeks until the trailer is supposedly perfect down to the individual frame, only for you to move on to a new unbearable horror. 
Unless people are talking about Get Out, then historically when they are talking about Blumhouse as a company on social media, they are talking about how cheap their movies are or how much money they make. Like that should even be the point of all of this. Ever since Paranormal Activity, Blum has been defined by how he can make a film for under $10 million and sometimes spin it to generate hundreds of millions at the box office. But I think more than that, his legacy should be defined by the seemingly toxic work environment that he has created, the boys club that he has built around himself, as well as the repeated backing of conservative films and filmmakers, despite calling himself a liberal to make money, which he clearly views as being more important than any values that he actually holds in this world. You know me. You know I want good original horror to thrive and to be successful. I am always happy when movies do well, but at the same time, the cartoonish reaction that people had on Twitter to Megan making 30 million in its first weekend was a little gross to me. All I heard about was how much it made and how they cut the violence and blood and kills out of a slasher movie to get it down to a PG-13 rating to make more money and how that was a good thing that the studio cut up a movie to make it worse because we have to worship the dollar just to see how rich Jason Blum can possibly get. Genuinely. Almost no one was actually talking about whether Megan was actually good or not. Nobody was talking about the movie itself, just the environment around the movie. The product itself is second to the money. Listen to any conversation about a Blumhouse film and it's always the same. Oh yeah, Five Nights at Freddy's sure was a big piece of shit, but did you see how much money it made? The conversation is always entirely surrounded on celebrating Blum's profit and how horror is supposedly back even though it never went anywhere. And in the case of Megan, when I saw it a few weeks into its run, I felt a resounding feeling of, that was fine, which is what I feel when I watch their work almost across the board. So I tend to kind of avoid them, because they aren't actually even really full movies. All art is a product, but we can agree that some art is more of a product than others. I don't think that anyone would argue that Ubisoft or EA games are more art than they are money-making ventures. Blumhouse movies are polished to the point of not possibly offending a single person who has a dollar in their pocket. By lacking any perspective or artistic goal other than to minimally entertain. Blum, who started as a sub-executive, reporting directly to Harvey Weinstein at Miramax, which is something that he has to me kind of tried to downplay in the years since, is in my eyes the symbol of everything that horror should not strive to be. Here are just several things that he has done since he started his company and positioned himself at the center of horror as a business. During the height of the strikes last year, he casually posted a picture of him holding a shotgun with David Zaslav, the most hated man in Hollywood, with the caption, Sun Valley Soldiers. He once tweeted, I got feedback from my team at Blumhouse, and picture below are my room for improvement categories. I am tweeting this to help remind myself to do these things and improve. The list included the following. Stay present. Listen. Slow down. Be compassionate. Create a safe space for ideas. Don't yell. Be less impulsive. Share information. Say thank you. <laughs> and hire diverse. And I'm honestly kind of astonished that he willingly tweeted that the people in his circle told him that he had to stop being racist, stop belittling the people who work for him, to stop verbally abusing them, and to just be decent around others. Because that is basically what that list says. He was asked by a fan on Twitter in 2021 about his film production's relationship to COVID. With the surge, is Halloween Ends going to start filming and be released on schedule? To which he said, so far, yeah. We are like the only ones shooting. My views on Omicron are extreme. If I shared them, my PR team would most likely burn down my house with me in it. I'm not trying to put words in his mouth, but at least to me, when I read that, it seems that he is implying that he did not care if his employees got COVID under his command and possibly died so long as the product continued to get made and that he could get even more wealthy. And then on top of that, one of his biggest crimes against horror to me is that he sat down to be a guest on the Ben Shapiro show. And you know, the old 1940s phrase that roughly goes, if you have 10 people and one Nazi willingly sitting down for a meal together, then all you have is 11 Nazis? So if one film executive sits down with a fascist for a civil conversation, then all you have are two fascists being broadcast over the internet who are hoping to enshrine each other's cultural power. At the top of the interview, he even jokes that he is ready for a wave of hatred just for willing to be seen in the same room as Shapiro publicly. So he definitely understands what he's doing here. He wasn't tricked into any of this. And in that, he has some pretty wild quotes that I think really shows that his heart is not in the right place, as far as the soulless, empty art that he produces is concerned, and to a greater degree, demonstrates the corruptive effect his legacy has had on how we look at modern horror cinema in general. One thing that I agree with the right about is how a lot of Hollywood, including myself, is out of touch with America, with the taste of America. 
There shouldn't be red state, blue state movies. There should just be good movies. I'd go so far as to say that if you were sitting with a director and they said, you know, you made Get Out, you made The Purge, you made The Hunt, I want to make a political movie. I want to do it about X topic. I want to do it about global warming. That is when I say we are in trouble, because I think it is virtually impossible to make a fun, entertaining movie. And think of the topic first. I think you have to think in your heart what's super scary. And if you can fold politics into that, like Jordan thinks about race all the time, clearly. Get Out came from that. But you can't just say I want to make a scary story about global warming. Hollywood had a red flag list for people Harvey Weinstein was worried about because they were talking badly about him. And I was on the list. And I was happy that I was on it. I wish that it was true what he said about me, because I wasn't actually doing that. The most important thing I want to say and the reason I'm doing your show is to say that all of Hollywood is not the same. We are different. I can be liberal, but talk to you and be on your show and make a movie called The Hunt. But if there was an amazing horror movie that came to me and it pushed a conservative value, I would make it. So I think that's probably the most important thing. At one point near the end, Ben Shapiro says, I get a lot of questions from people in my audience that say, I really want to work in Hollywood. I love storytelling. I'm afraid that because I was a member of Students for Trump, then now I'm going to go to Hollywood and that's on my Facebook page and I'm not going to get a job. To which Jason Blum says, well then you have to come to our office. We will give you a job in a second. And I hope that you can see that these things are business major brain rot ideas that violate the concept of how art should be made. Everything that he's saying here is how you wind up with the kinds of bad movies that have no perspective that Blumhouse produces. It is 100% reasonable to start a screenplay with a theme that you want to express. I would call that good writing. Please, if you want to make movies, do not start writing a horror script based around only the scares that you can think of first and hope that some thematic through lines will come into your work through divine intervention because it does not work that way. All good writers know that you need to have some forethought into what you are trying to express so that you can then build a narrative around that. In fact, in my opinion, the actual writing of the script should be the very last part of the process. That is following, you know, months of just thinking about your story from every single angle. And also you should not be concerned at all moments on if your art is actually entertaining or not. I would argue that if you have produced an intelligent script that is compelling or makes your audience work and to think, then it will be engaging in its own right. And that entertainment is for live sports and social events. Writers should not at all times in every circumstance concern themselves with the idea of the word entertainment. Because that is a hole that once fallen down will very often lead to hacky dialogue and art that is not true to the person who is creating it. Basically, I'm saying that if you're wanting to make something, you should never once consider if your audience is actually going to like it while you're working on it. Because the art needs to be made out of your own personal enjoyment and perspective that comes from the act of self-expression, of ideas that are important and compelling to you. And if you do that, if you make something that you are passionate about, then one day you will find your audience. And some will think I'm saying that everything should be art house and that is not what I'm getting at at all. You can make pop art through that exact same mindset. I highly doubt that James Cameron cares for a second if anyone found Avatar 2 to be entertaining. He is clearly making these for himself. And you know, I think that's a great thing. We just get the benefit of being able to watch him do this and to make these films that he makes. If you want to learn how to be a good writer, please go watch the Jason Blum and Ben Shapiro hour-long interview and then take to heart the exact opposite of every single thing that those men say. Oh, and you know, one other thing, remember Dashcam that we talked about a little while ago? That was a Blumhouse movie. You remember They Slash Them? That was also a Blumhouse movie. They are kind of the kings of the conservative bent to horror. One criticism of the genre that you could legitimately make is about how it's been done for a long time, in that horror is a genre largely built on the trauma of women, fearing and being attacked by men men, who often are not actually allowed to voice their experiences through the art that they make, while men make money off of telling their stories. Women are almost never allowed to write or direct major films still today, which is a huge problem across the entire film industry. But it is especially bad with Blumhouse. Almost every single Blumhouse movie stars a woman who is saying lines about how her character should feel that a man wrote for her. You know, 
just spitballing here, but if I was being accused of being an abusive and sexist boss, who also hangs out with David Zaslov and was just generally awful, not just by the people around me, but also by critics for popular news organizations, and I was also in the process of basically remaking one of the most famous movies of all time about a woman experiencing violence from a powerful man, I probably would have used that as an opportunity to buy myself some public goodwill and hire some women to make that movie. Instead of a male director that was mostly known before this for male-focused stoner comedies, three male writers, 15 male producers, three male composers, a male cinematographer, a male editor, a male production designer, a male art director, and basically an all-male crew. Outside of actors, the only women who held any prominent positions within Halloween were the production manager, the casting director, and the costume designer. And the same could be said for the next two movies in the series as well, despite all three of them basically pretending to be about why it is important to listen to women. And then, years later, if I was still having that same criticism placed against me, and I was remaking yet another classic movie about violence against women, or at least, you know, women in peril, <laughs> and also after having publicly said that I had changed my ways and learned because I listened to the people around me, I would probably surround myself on that project with some different people, instead of hiring that same male director, four male writers, 13 male producers, two male composers, a male cinematographer, a male editor, a male production designer, and two male art directors, with again, the only major production roles being filled by women being casting directors, costume designers, and set decorators. But you know, that's just me. Blumhouse have been involved in the production of 152 movies in total, or, according to Dan Aykroyd, a little over 1% of all films that have ever been made, with basically every single film in their catalog either being about women main protagonists or having women hold very prominent roles within the film's narrative and often very traditional roles for these women characters, such as mothers of straight white families or sisters. An epic game of modern warfare. Yeah, that's what save buttons are for, pal. The overwhelming amount of women characters in their films are either this or someone who is younger that is being pursued by a straight white guy. They have almost no films that are almost exclusively about men, which I think is fairly common for the horror genre, especially popcorn PG-13 horror films, which are very dominated by women protagonists, which is Blumhouse's bread and butter. I did actually recently see a study that said that only 44% of horror films actually have women protagonists, which on a surface level, I don't really believe, but it very well may be true. And I may think that there are more women protagonists than there are because the films that star women often just work better on a conceptual level than the ones that star men to me. Horror is about social injustice and an imbalance of power and people fighting back against that. And it is hard to buy a general horror situation if you make the protagonist an upper class white guy who has struggled, you know, very little in his life. It is definitely true that if you go through their catalog, Blumhouse overwhelmingly makes films that have strong feminine presence within their narratives. Now, this is going off of my count, and I might be a little off here because there are just a lot of titles to go through, and I might have missed a couple here or there. But from what I can tell, out of their 152 films, only 25 of them have been written by women, and only 17 of them have been directed by women. 19 of them were written by people who were not white, and 26 of them were directed by people who were not white. Every other role on these projects was filled by a white man. So if we say that's 152 movies, then that is 304 jobs, although some of these films did have multiple writers and directors. But for the sake of simplicity, we will say that every movie had one writer position and one director position. So by those numbers, that means that Blumhouse historically is only hiring 14% non-white creatives and 13% women creatives for those roles. And if you took James Wan, Jordan Peele, and M. Night Shyamalan out of the equation, their non-white hiring numbers plummet to almost near zero which makes it almost cartoonish when you see that they have movies made about black people, such as Exorcist Believer and Ma, which were both written and directed by white guys, and that they always advertise their films as from the studio that brought you Get Out, but rarely actually hire non-white people or women for behind-the-camera roles on their projects, unless they are already famous and can be leveraged to generate money for them from that. And also it should be said that almost all of these hires, both for people of color and for women, come in the past couple of years after people started to realize that they basically exclusively only hired white dudes and began to criticize them for those practices. Also, I do think that it is very interesting that after the hit that they had with Get Out, that Jordan Peele left the company and distanced himself from Blum. Typically, if you have an iconic work of art, you tend to kind of stick with that team that has a proven model for success. And I think that it is very telling that the two never seem to acknowledge each other anymore, except for when Blum uses Get Out to seem more progressive than he actually is. 
At one point, when asked about why he only hired white men for top positions in his films, he said that there was simply no women to hire, and was quoted as saying, We're always trying to do that. We're not trying to do that because of recent events. We've always been trying. There are just not a lot of female directors, period, and even less that are inclined to do horror. I'm a massive admirer of Jennifer Kent. I've offered her every movie we've had available. She's turned me down every time. Which is like the most shameful answer he could have given there. To say that he's always looking to hire these people, but that they simply just don't exist is so fucking silly. If Blumhouse tweeted that they were looking for young women to make films for them, they would have hundreds or thousands of people responding that they would love to be given that opportunity. I'm just trying to point out a painfully glaring pattern in their structural behavior as a company, which I hope you can recognize is a big issue. So, just in general, I think the whole company and their output could fall into this category of being bad conservative horror movies, to some degree or another. But for this last one, I'd like to focus on The Hunt. There was a movie that was so marred by false controversy and culture war bullshit that even Trump tweeted about it when he was still president, saying, Liberal Hollywood is racist at the highest level, and with great anger and hate. They like to call themselves elite, but they are not elite. In fact, it is often the people that they so strongly oppose that are actually the elite. The movie coming out is made in order to inflame and cause chaos. They create their own violence and then try to blame others. They are the true racists and are very bad for our country. So to generate false controversy, Blum pulled the film from release himself, basically saying that as a work of art, it was just too dangerous to release to the public in the current political climate. Which, you know, considering that he was seemingly willing to sacrifice his employees to COVID on the altar of money, I don't really buy the safety excuse and instead see this as a publicity move to get people to talk about his lackluster films. Because when they later released it. It gave them the opportunity to then advertise it as the most talked about movie of the year is one nobody's seen yet. And then when you watch the movie, it is the most middle of the road, centrist, weak, fake, controversial stuff that you've ever seen. They uses 2016 buzzwords like deplorables to incite feelings in the most non-threatening way possible. It is Facebook activism and depicts conservatives and liberals as both causing harm but only doing so in a way that reinforces each other and ultimately does nothing to challenge any semblance of the status quo. I think that any movie that on the surface wants to be seen as deeply political and as an important work of art, but then restrains itself to only comparing Republicans and Democrats is not something that should be treated as a serious exercise of social satire that is being done in good faith, and should be seen for what it is, which is a knife to skim cream off the current tensions of the American culture for profit. They are in this moment no different from the talking heads of Fox News or MSNBC, who get paid to lie 24 hours a day. But I think the biggest argument that you could make about how weak the hunt actually is as a work of satire comes from something that Blum says to Shapiro in their interview that I think demonstrably shows how his centrism allows passage for Shapiro's fascism. The hunt is about how the country is so polarized. You know, I did a lot of research on you before I came in here because I was told of your views. And I looked at what you've said and done and all you've expressed is a conservative point of view. I believe a lot of things that are different from you. We probably have many more things that are in common and share many more beliefs than our political beliefs. And the idea that we can't talk to each other or that I can't come on your show makes me furious. The movie really makes fun of both sides. This movie does not take sides politically. If you're not aware, Wendigoon is a horror conspiracy theorist YouTuber with several million subscribers that, as you will hopefully come to see, should not be seen as the wholesome, southern, friendly dad persona that he has publicly constructed around himself in the past several years. And that, like many people who talk about being Christians as much as he does, has a dark past with deep ties to far-right extremism. On a base level, his work has never been of personal interest to me. We share a similar focus on topics that we like to write about. but. Our similarities basically in there. I have no need or desire to hear five hours of opinions on Blood Meridian from a 21 year old millionaire who got famous around the age of 19. And I know that is probably the most boomer thing that I have ever said. Apologies for that. But I say that to argue that I really do think that there are some works that are really not intended to hit the right way until we are older. There are some works that fundamentally will not be understood by you if you are wealthy and have always been upper class your entire life. And this may all sound condescending, but that doesn't stop it from being somewhat true. I don't mean that to think that you shouldn't be able to say or publish whatever you like at any point in your life. You're obviously free to do so. 
And I also don't want it to be seen as if I'm talking down to young people, because I'm not. Politically, they are frequently the most with it, and their voices should be heard on issues that pertain to them. They are looked down upon too often in our culture. What I'm talking about here pertains to the very act of writing itself. And with that, perspective. And I don't know if you can actually really truly be a good cultural critic with a voice that has a definitive perspective without several years of genuine, independent, lived experience away from the home that you were raised in. And in his case, he became exceptionally wealthy by the time that he was 19 or 20. And so if you leave the home and immediately become famous and rich without having to ever actually truly struggle, can you be considered to have ever actually had lived experience at all that would qualify you to give criticism on works of art about the experience of average and poor people? I would argue not. And if that is the case, why would your perspective matter as a critic? Not to mention the fact that Wendigoon was raised in a very wealthy family, and with that comes from a wealthy perspective. He himself has inadvertently admitted that his family at one point had millions of dollars. When he said once on stream, would you believe me that when my dad was young, he used to be in an organized crime gang and is now a Sunday school teacher. Very wild life that guy's lived. He was in an organized crime gang that my grandfather ran. A lot of bad things went down. They got investigated by the FBI. My grandpa went to jail. My dad had to testify and tried to take up the business. The business fell apart and he ended up losing millions of dollars to the state lost everything, found God, became a Christian, and is now both the best man and the best Christian I've ever met. But also, I'm not even here to criticize his body of work. I think his videos are very uninteresting, but ultimately that is secondary to what makes him worth talking about. The first of which are the very strong beliefs that he seems to hold as important, that are in my opinion the antithesis of what horror should be about. There are many things that are red flags that we could talk about from the bizarre gun ownership, the flagrant use from my perspective of his religion as a shield from criticism to the belief that he at one point followed many far-right accounts on Twitter from Kyle Rittenhouse to Parler, the social media website where the January 6th insurrection was in part planned. People said, oh, he only followed them, but that doesn't mean that he agrees with them. But there are screenshots of tweets that may have been deleted that clearly in my mind show a support to Rittenhouse. Although, since I did not take these screenshots, they do have to be taken with a grain of salt. But in relation to everything else that we're going to talk about here, to me it seems to fall in line with his general beliefs. These have been widespread across the internet and to my knowledge, I can find no examples of him directly saying that these are not real. So he may or may not have actually followed these accounts or supported them. But I do not believe that he has ever outright said that this did not happen, so take that as you will. We could talk about his past and supposedly being a founding member in an online conspiracy theory group that, according to him, snowballed out of control into being a white supremacist neo-Nazi organization called the Boogaloo Boys. His online username at the time was Boogaloo Boy, and he claims to be the first to have started using it, but that he left the group and became Windigoon after things started to get out of hand. And this is not a conspiracy theory in itself. Shockingly, he literally has said so in writing. As you'll see, he was just like, oh geez, sorry guys, about starting a violent hate group, guys. Sorry that people got killed. I totally didn't mean to do all that. My bad. I'll do better next time. Also, it should be noted that the Boogaloo Boys are known for wearing Hawaiian shirts. And guess who else always has on a Hawaiian shirt? Despite the fact that he publicly totally does not share in their beliefs, guys. I'm just saying that if at the very least I, in any way whatsoever, somehow accidentally, inadvertently, started a hate group. I wouldn't continue to still dress like them if it were me. It would make me look like I still believed in their cause and that I just couldn't talk about it because people would publicly get mad at me. If I accidentally started a hate terrorist organization, I wouldn't rebrand as a horror YouTuber the next year and instead would try and fight that ideology as much as I could. And if I didn't do that, then it would probably be fair for people to assume that I still agreed with their actions. At one point, he posted on his subreddit and wrote, Someone asked me about my old Boogaloo Boy persona, so I made my response and thought I'd share it to set the record straight. Again, I hate being political, but I wanted to clear this up. Love y'all. Thanks. The statement that he included with this read, Alright, so I'll go ahead and make my official statement here, because better to come straight from me. Over two years ago, I was among the first to begin using the term Boogaloo. Originally, it was a rendition of Che Guevara's, not that he was a good person by any means, code word for revolution. And I have always been a proponent of freedom and liberty. 
I believe in the divine rights of every human and therefore aspects of self-independence are important to me. So I began using the word in small settings and then decided to make a meme page using the name as no one had yet done so. To give you an idea, my name was Boogaloo Boy and several have pointed to me as being the original and started the Hawaiian shirt thing as I've always just worn those shirts. However, as the term became mainstream, more ideas began to come into the group. Everything from Antifa members to fascists wanted in on it and the original idea became muddled and broken. I always meant it as a for the people thing, yet it quickly became something else. To give you an idea, I watched the same news station call it a far leftist movement and a far right movement in the same day. It became something I didn't want to be a part of and so I left. I dropped the name, took a break, and decided to talk about things I enjoyed like conspiracies and movies under the new title, Windagoon. It was something I acknowledge but am not a part of anymore for what it became. Some of my current followers and friends were with me then, but I'm not a part of that anymore. So, do you remember when armed men were arrested a few years ago for planning the kidnapping of Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmire? That was the Boogaloos. Do you remember when white people showed up at the George Floyd protests and caused property damage and violence in the hopes that black people would be blamed for that? That was the Boogaloos. A great deal of their members were spotted in the Capitol during the January 6th insurrection. In 2020, they killed several police officers in a drive-by shooting in Oakland, hoping that black people would be blamed for the violence in an attempt to create racial tension. The reason they use the word Boogaloo is in reference to a meme that says Civil War II Electric Boogaloo, obviously in reference to the 1984 film Break Into Electric Boogaloo. Okay, so let's take a closer look at some of the phrasing of his official statement. First off, I have tried and failed to find any connection to the word Boogaloo to Che Guevara. In fact, when you Google Che Guevara Boogaloo, you just get things related to Windagoon. When you type in Che Guevara word for revolution, you get things related to Windagoon. Che Guevara died in 1967, and the earliest example of the word Boogaloo that I can find was in 1966 in relation to the musical style. So I would wager that that is more than likely a lie to cover his actual intentions and sympathies that he held as a seemingly radicalized teenager. According to the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the word Boogaloo began to appear in online forums related to hate content on 4chan somewhere between 2010 and 2012, when, you know, Windagoon would have been about 10 to 12 years old. Specifically, I have seen multiple times that it is believed to have been born on gun-related forums. I can find no evidence that within their organizational structure that they have any allusion to their values starting or being connected to Che Guevara in any capacity. So claiming he was the first to start using it or among the first is not true and is frankly a bizarre claim to make. By the time he would have made his Boogaloo Boy username, the word would have already had a near decade of being entrenched into the deepest layers of alt-right internet radicalized extreme racism. He wants to simultaneously be seen as distanced from the organization, but still dresses like them on a daily basis and fully takes responsibility in claiming that he started their movement that was already in motion at least seven or so years before his involvement, which to me just kind of seems like he enjoys taking the credit for that. As historically, he already had an out that he was in middle school when it truly actually began. And if he's lying about these things, it just makes me wonder, what else is he lying about? And the difficulty in seeing the lies and between the things that are true is always the point with these kinds of people who say, for instance, that they do not believe in far-right hate while doing something else at the same time, such as wearing a distinctly coded Hawaiian shirt that would be understood by the initiated. As Jared Thompson puts it, who works with the Transnational Threats Project that focuses on the evolution of digital terrorist networks, Boogaloo memes and slang are often deployed in similar formats and using similar language to more mainstream internet discourse, creating a challenge in parsing the difference between complex inside jokes and memes that are used as a tool of Boogaloo extremism. Then Windagoon would go on to say that the organization was corrupted by the left and the right equally, but I can find no evidence that the left ever tried to co-opt an organization that actively desires a race war within America. Just on the surface, that makes no sense. And on top of this, people who are centrist or on the left do not use the phrasing Antifa members. The only people who say that are the ones that see Antifa as some sort of homogenous radical left-wing activist group 
as opposed to a general term for anti-fascist movements. He is kind of telling on himself by saying Antifa members, as if they are a part of an organized political militia, like many alt-right groups are, such as the Boogaloos. And saying that there was harm and violence perpetrated on both sides is the kind of language that other fascists, like Trump, say to disorient people into not seeing far-right extremism for what it is. He makes the bizarre false claim that he invented the use of the word boogaloo as a for the people kind of thing. And he doesn't believe in what that group did with his idealization of anti-government ideals. And also wants it to be very clear that he is not a political person. But to my ears, this is all conservative doublespeak. And I hope that this is becoming obvious to you as well. In my opinion, there is a regular pattern of behavior there, from supporting Rittenhouse to having multiple ties to other far-right extremist figures. That I think a clear picture is painted that he does not mean this as a communist kind of thing, and seemingly more so means people as a very select group. Windagoon is very publicly friends with Turkey Tom. They have been seen together on multiple occasions, and I have seen online mentions that Tom was either at his wedding or at the very least was invited. Tom has been accused of using the N-word multiple times in private conversations, including these screenshots of texts that are alleged to be real. And he has also been accused of saying that the upper tiers of his Patreon were intended for Jews with deep pockets. Windagoon is publicly connected to the Internet Historian, and has even appeared in his videos. The Internet Historian publicly said that his birthday was April 20th. It is not, and has only said that as a joke because that is Hitler's birthday. Windagoon is publicly friends with Donut Operator, and even retweeted a photograph of the two of them hugging. Donut Operator is a gun-crazed, very far-right YouTuber with 4 million subscribers, whose career consists of him reviewing footage of police officers shooting and killing people. He was once a cop himself, before he made more money making YouTube videos and retired. His content is very pro-state, pro-cop, pro-gun, and pro-death to people who don't share his beliefs propaganda. For example, one of his videos is titled, Predator Takes Shotgun to the Face, and features a picture of him smiling in the corner of the thumbnail next to an image of a terrified man about to be executed by cops, with the text that reads, Head Removal. Hi everyone, Donut here. We got a couple of shootings for you today. The main shooting just warms my heart. And you know, for someone who supposedly is so very anti-government, Wintagoon seems very comfortable with a man who makes his living worshipping violence committed by the state. He's a man of no conviction, claiming to be very against the government and for the rights of the people, while at the same time giving a warm embrace to one of the biggest fascist bootlickers on the internet. And the only thing that one could reasonably gather from this picture of them hugging is that he too is a fascist bootlicker himself. He has collaborated with Nick Crowley, who constantly makes money through the most morbid and shameful true crime content of showcasing the last minutes of people before they are suddenly and unexpectedly killed. Crowley is similar to Windigoon in that on the surface they seem fairly edgy but clean enough. But then you notice that he follows less than 200 people on Twitter, and among them are the same circle with names like Windigoon, Plagued Moth, Turkey Tom, Mr. Ballin, and Donut Operator. Windigoon has collaborated with Plagued Moth, a completely shameful content creator who reviewed snuff films on his Patreon before it was taken down, and has been accused of showing genuine gore content to minors on Discord, and whose main YouTube channel consists of him reviewing censored videos of horrible acts of real-life violence and death. He is publicly friends with Shoe on Head, who is a conservative masquerading as a leftist, who has built a career off of lazy anti-woke content complaining about SJWs, who says stuff like, Karl Marx rising from the grave finding out his movement has been taken over by fat, ugly, mentally ill losers. He is friends with Brandon Buckingham, a gun YouTuber who has been accused of threatening rape. He is friends with Oompaville, a gun-obsessed content creator that has taken advantage of Nakado Avocado's mental decline for fame and for money, and on top of that has made content with the human trafficker Andrew Tate. He is friends with Mudahar, who argued against Andrew Tate being deplatformed from social media websites, and has recently showcased a great deal of transphobia in his most recent video. He has publicly interacted in a friendly way with the account Rock Solid on multiple occasions, and with just a quick look at their profile, I saw them liking anti-trans posts and neo-Nazi content. He interacts positively with Disclose.tv, a far-right propaganda website that uses hate speech, engages in Holocaust denialism, and platforms neo-Nazis. He has appeared in content with Mr. Guns and Gear, whose Twitter bio reads, dedicated to restoring the civil rights of Americans. But despite that, he's tweeted negatively about trans people many times. 
He has interacted positively with Garantham, who has said, The traditional family should be encouraged and strengthened. I see little to no support from the government or big media. He has said anti-trans statements. He has called people degenerates, and has said that non-traditional sexual interactions are a disgusting, hedonistic lifestyle that is the breakdown of the family unit. Windagoon is publicly friends with Brandon Herrera, who has made jokes that implied that he was sympathetic with public shooters who killed leftists, and collaborated with Kyle Rittenhouse, who has posted images of himself with an MP40, which is a gun used by the Nazis, that he described as the original ghetto blaster. I've also seen people insinuate that Herrera was with Windigoon in the days of being part of the Boogaloo movement, but I cannot find substantial proof on if this is true or not. But I've seen several comments saying this, so online it is at least culturally believed to be true. He has appeared in gun-related content with Haley Luan, an influencer whose content is based entirely around making the United States military appear fun and bizarrely sexually appealing, which again, for someone who is supposedly anti-government, he sure does seem to have a lot of wealthy white friends who actively work to uphold the values of the American Empire. Or we could talk about the time that he stole art to use in promotional material for his videos, and then blamed it on his editorial team instead of just taking the responsibility. Then, of course, there is his username. To the Algonquin people, the Wendigo is a negative spiritual symbol that is to be avoided and whose name is to never even be said out loud or written down. So I know there's a bit of a hypocrisy there on my part, but we kind of do have to say it for academic purposes, so apologies for that. Starting with Algernon Blackwood's horror short story called The Wendigo, people have for hundreds of years taken the creature and used it for their own means, including Wendigoon in his very name, which is something that indigenous people have been very critical with him now for years. This next thing that I'm trying to argue is not to discredit his feelings regarding to his own personal history. But what I will say is that Americans who are white or partially white in rural areas love to claim a percentage of native heritage for bizarre conservative reasons, relating to, like, reverence for the land and fascistic nostalgia for a time that never existed and stuff like that. He has attempted to deflect from criticism over the use of the name by saying that his grandfather was Native American and that he learned these things culturally through him. But I personally have to look at it from the hypothetical perspective, where Say I had a black or mixed grandfather in this situation, and black people were telling me that I was doing something that was racist or offensive to them. I would then listen to what they were saying instead of claiming that I had the right to do it because I had some melanin in me. Especially if I were more or less raised within a primarily white cultural area like the Appalachian Mountains are. <laughs> and also on top of that, just, you know, frequently associated myself with white supremacists. There are 26 million people in this region, and well over 80% of them are white, with the majority of the others being Latinos. And if I had no cultural connection around me to that non-white percentage of my history, then what really would give me the right to dictate whether or not what I was doing was appropriate? I really would have no ground to stand on. The other thing that I would add to this is that Windagoon and I are practically neighbors, and I know this area very well. Okay. So, I live in Asheville, North Carolina, and between that and the reservation, you have the community of Lake Junaluska, which isn't actually even a real town. You can walk across the whole thing in a matter of minutes. You got Waynesville, you have Maggie Valley, and a few other small drive-by communities. And beyond that is the Cherokee Reservation. Windagoon lives somewhere just on the other side of the reservation. That is not me doxing him. He has said many times publicly that he lives in East Tennessee, and I'm not even saying what town he lives in. According to the latest census, there are only 23 black people who live in Maggie Valley. There are 15 Native Americans despite it touching the reservation. Most of this area used to be sundown towns. It is about as white as you could possibly get. Deep Appalachia is very white country, and for the most part, is exceptionally racist. Genuinely in this part of the country, you have to assume that any white person you meet is racist unless they show you otherwise. Almost all of these little towns are well over 90% white. But if you were to drive through Maggie Valley, you would find antique stores selling busts of Native American braves, carved wooden eagles, vintage paintings of buffalo, super racist generalizations that idealize the idea of the noble, good kind of Native American. And then you'll drive onto the reservation, and it's just run down and poor as shit except for the casino. He has said that the Wendigoon name came from his cultural connection to Native lore through his grandfather's side. But I can assure you that unless you were on the reservation itself, that actual Native culture has no aspect in the general lives of the people around here, other than the racist trinkets that depict them. 
And as I said a moment ago, the Wendigo is Algonquin, who are nowhere close to the vicinity of the Cherokee, who are in the southern Appalachia region and throughout the lower sections of Middle America. The Algonquin people are Canadian and a little bit Northern American. To insinuate that he can use the Wendigo name by citing local cultural native customs is completely absurd to a person who lives in the same general vicinity as he does. It is obvious that he just thought Wendigos were cool and has come up with some seemingly strange backstory lie that is easily proven to not be true. Unless, you know, his grandfather is Algonquin and just moved to Tennessee. But if that were the case, I don't know why he wouldn't just come out and say that by now. And the reason why he doesn't is because it isn't true. There's a lot of bizarre religious-like mythologizing around his past that I particularly hate. Like it always being said that his interest in cryptids and horror began with oral folk tales in Appalachia that are passed down and told to children. I assure you, as someone who lives near him and has for most of my life, this is total bullshit. And is some weird false cultural imaginative idealization of the American South that is not actually true to the real Appalachia. We aren't sitting around at night talking about the goddamn Mothman and shit. I even came from a poor family and he didn't. When I was a kid, I have seen people riding into towns on horseback. He admits to being raised by millionaires who got their money from crime. He just likes spooky stories, which is fine. So do I, obviously. But to come up with some weird folksy reason as to why he became a folklore YouTuber that somehow culminated with the destiny of local oral tradition is the kind of language that is used by members of a cult of personality. They might as well claim that he was born on a fucking mountaintop. Nobody talks about it. But don't you think it is extremely weird and off-putting that all of his fans call him dad? Isn't that really strange? What follows is an exchange between two anonymous indigenous people about how they feel about him and his behaviors. I've been watching a YouTuber named Windigoon for a long time, and I noticed that his username always made me feel weird. He often uses Windigo imagery in his merch and made it a part of his brand. He says that his grandfather is Cherokee and taught him the legend and I'm not going to make assumptions on if he is lying or not, but I feel really weird still. It feels really disrespectful to me to use that name. I'm not sure if I'm being a baby about it or if there's something wrong here. He has also said some shit about cultural appropriation that put up some serious red flags for me. The Wendigo comes from the Algonquin people. I don't think Cherokees come from that group. Plus he's presenting the white people concept of a Wendigo. You can call him out, but he has 3.5 million subs. His community will probably hunt you down before you ever get him to shut down. What follows is the comment that they were referring to about cultural appropriation, where a native person called out Wendigoon for his use of their spiritual symbol, to which he said to them, I'm actually going to make a video on this in order to make a direct response, but for now, cultural appropriation is a good way to alienate one group of people from the other. Whenever a society makes advancements in art and literature, and then another society gatekeeps others from interacting with it, it makes the creators seem inhuman and odd. The easiest way to create prejudice is to convince others that a group of people should not be interacted with. I have spoken to several natives who love the concept, yet only those who have no value in its existence say I shouldn't talk about it, inciting an indoctrinated superiority. Furthermore, when we stop talking about cultures, they die. This is especially applicable to Native Americans, who use spoken word to pass down their stories, and if we do not continue to speak their stories, their culture dies before we do. Lastly, I was raised in Appalachia, and my entire life has been filled with stories of the mountains and creatures that lurk in the dark. My culture is as American as any, and I recognize the importance in keeping the fire alive. I in no way mean this to attack or to be direct, just a simple reply. If we develop the idea that we can't speak of certain people, then we're no better than those who silence them. He's basically using the I have a few black friends excuse to tell indigenous people to fuck off and to not bother him so that he can continue without criticism to make a lot of money by selling plushies of a monster that was invented by a white British man that is ultimately making fun of their culture, as well as plastic figurines, posters, shirts, and other merchandise that depicts Wendigos. I don't know if he fully realizes the irony of being a rich and famous person taking a symbolic figure from a smaller native group of people that he is not connected to in any way, that is at least in part to them originally used as a metaphor for colonialism. The reason that this comment is publicly still available is because Wendigoon archived it by posting a screenshot of it 
early in his channel's life to his Reddit page as a clarification of his official position on why he should be able to use the name, saying, Hey everyone, so I hate getting political, but this keeps coming up. I'm showing this comment reply now, so my opinions can be made known going forward. I've also blocked out the original commenter, and please do not show hate if you see it on the video. Also, I'm at 50k. I love you all so much. Also, I have received comments from natives who advise me not to use the term Wendigo, as it is a bad omen and is dangerous. That is entirely different from not talking about a group of people altogether. They genuinely believe the legend and want me to be safe. They're cool. Thumbs up emoji. It has become a more common thing for people to call him out on his beliefs his behaviors, and at the continued use of the Wendigo in his name and the merchandise that he makes a lot of money off of. It became so much of a conversation that he even put out a statement, trying to shut this down, saying, Some rude and slanderous things have been said about my character and I just want to clarify that I am not right-wing or bigoted or anything besides thankful for my opportunity to make goofy YouTube. The only thing I believe in is loving God and my wife. Donut Operator you know, the ex-cop who makes death content. The Wendigoon shared a picture of the two of them hugging not long after this. Can be found in the comments of this post asking if Wendigoon wants him to start killing people who said that he was right-wing. I think that this is an all-time bad public statement that says absolutely nothing substantial. And that's the point. I quote tweeted this and said, Not that I have a stake in this whatsoever, but this is such a non-statement that doesn't even address any of the issues that folks are criticizing him for. Someone using their religion as a shield in the same breath, as claiming that they believe in nothing politically, is a red flag. Oh, I'm just a goofy, wholesome boy. Please don't ask me why I follow less than 500 people and one of them was Kyle Rittenhouse. Don't ask me about all the guns that I post pictures of. I promise I have no strong beliefs. Apolitical, really. Why are you slandering me? I really only care about this because if you have that large of a platform and make your money from being a public persona, then you are no longer fully a private person and your political beliefs do in fact matter and are a fair topic of debate. You can't get mad if people call you on questionable things that are said or done if you are making money off of them. And what resulted from some good faith criticism of his use of language was days upon days of people calling me a faggot. Amongst other things, but that was their go-to word. And to be honest, if you're a public figure who is being criticized publicly and the only people who come to your defense are Nazis, then that can only be read as two ways. Either that you're sympathetic to their views, or that you're perfectly fine making money from them and are comfortable with that ideology being the backbone of your base. And this did go on for like at least a week, where every single time I said anything, my mentions were just filled with the most vile far-right rhetoric from Wendigoon fans. And if anyone ever criticized me and people's reaction to it was to immediately start using hate speech, I would shut that shit down so fast. I think that most decent people who work online would do the exact same. And if they don't want to be seen as a big group of Nazis, then let's see how they react to this video's existence. Because I am certain they will be very level-headed about all of this. Right in the midst of this going on, a very funny thing happened, and that Wendigoon followed me on Twitter. I was not following him at the time. He never publicly told people to stop calling me a friend. He never once reached out to me privately. But he did follow me. Which means in my eyes that he 100% knew what was happening because I did tweet about it several times and then followed me to let me know that he knew and that he was watching and that he intended to do nothing to stop it. Why else would he follow me in that exact moment? He has never interacted with a single one of my posts. Not one like, not one comment. We are not friends. But he does follow me. He follows next to nobody on Twitter. What other motivation could he have had there to follow me in that specific moment? other than to be a method of quiet and deniable intimidation. What other way could that have been read from my perspective? If you think it was entirely coincidental, which he may argue it was, then I've got a sack of magic beans I'd like to sell to you. That was the moment that pushed me over the edge to make this video. There are other very public instances from him of transphobia and homophobia. Like when he allegedly said, calling Chris Chan, a man who mutilated his body with a box cutter because 4chan said he was a girl, holds a deep hatred for men and most women, decided to be a girl so that he could hook up with lesbians, and now abused his mom. She is disrespectful to and delegitimizes trans people. Like he, a very publicly straight married Christian cis man, somehow is the authority on what legitimizes a trans person's identity. He has tried to cover this up and has denied that it happened, but I think there's enough evidence to say that it most likely did. One user said at one point, he's been constantly misgendering her on Twitter despite being corrected numerous times. To which Wendigoon said, 
Show me one time I misgendered her on Twitter. Actually, please don't watch my content if you're going through my replies and monitoring followers, who may just be unaware of Chris Chan's entire lore. Perhaps people just not knowing something doesn't mean that they're a transphobe. But if we go back and look at old screenshots from this time, you can see that this account is quote tweeting Wendigoon's transphobic tweet, but if you go to that account today, that post is now quote tweeting a deleted tweet which to me shows that more than likely Wendigoon went mask off with his transphobia and then deleted the tweet sometime afterwards when he realized that people would be mad about it. But there's a very small chance that this is not true because I did not take the original screenshot, so make of that what you will. We could talk about the time that Nick Spears did a video about the disturbing movie Iceberg, who is a great horror trans creator and I really hope that she's not mad at me for mentioning her here because I think she's very cool and you should definitely go read her books. But Wendigoon famously did a very popular video on that particular iceberg challenge as well. And in the comments of her video, he said, We will be watching your career with great interest. Which is just kind of gross, because in a way it is similar to him following me. It is him telling her that he sees that she's doing similar content to him, and his presence in the comments is undercutting her video. While he also at the same time seemingly makes it look like he supports trans people. Like in the responses to his comments. People are saying things like, Wendigoon says trans rights, while meanwhile he's simultaneously tweeting about Chris Chan multiple times. We could talk about another time, where someone made a YouTuber gay sex alignment chart and put Wendigoon as a sub bottom, to which he responded to them and said, what did I do to hurt you? Which, you know, clearly is a joke, but also the worst kinds of straight guys when they make jokes related to queerness, almost exclusively direct the punchline at femme gays and bottoms because they view them as lesser than masculine tops. He has multiple times said that he supports queer people, but I think his actions in private clearly paint a different picture. He once tweeted, saying, I do not care if someone is gay or straight. Sexuality is no one's business but the individual. Don't make assumptions. I make an effort to stay away from politics and social issues. Which, you know, first off, equating sexuality with politics kind of already shows what you kind of think of the issue. And second off, Clearly, as we have seen, everything that he does has deep political motivations, and to argue that he's just a horror YouTuber is comical. Far-right figures are often the only ones who hide their harm under a false shield of wanting to seem like they have no strong beliefs at all, because their real views are so socially abhorrent. And the thing that people kept saying to me in all of this was, why do you even care? Which, if you watch the comments under the video, I guarantee you will happen again, with takes like, Oh, he's just a YouTuber. Why does it matter? Or so what if he's a conservative? Is that a problem? Which the answer to that is yes. But the reason that I care is because this does not belong in horror or anywhere. I care deeply about horror and everything that he does has demonstrated so far in his career that he should not be welcomed in our spaces or even, you know, just in public in general. I think that these things clearly showcase a repeated pattern, in my opinion, of racism and homophobia, while on top of that, being very irresponsible and dangerous with his large platform. Like, I think that anyone who supposedly accidentally starts a neo-Nazi hate group and fully acknowledges that they did that should not be accepted within society at all. They should not be celebrated. They should be treated for what they are. Because remember kids, when somebody shows you who they are, believe them.